Welcome to another um, exciting talk in the Kushwant Singh Literary Festival held online this year, though very much a London event. And today, I think we're, we're bringing together once again more concerns of Kushwant Singh when we talk about crossing borders. Because one thing that really does cross borders is a detective novel. And, you know, one of those things in India, it's always wonderful to hear, you know, Sherlock Holmes seems to have his own incarnation in India. And our British author, Lord Geoffrey Archer, he too is an international figure who has an enormous fan following in India. Today, he's going to be talking, well, do I have to introduce Geoffrey Archer? I suppose I ought to out of politeness, but he's published in 97 countries, which is really crossing borders, translated into 33 different languages, really one of the world's best-selling authors as his sales now are um, about 275 million copies of his books, an author who really crosses borders. And he's talking today to Mihir Bose, who is based here in London and writes for many publications, as well as being a broadcast journalist and author of more than 30 books. His most recent book being The Nine Waves, The Extraordinary Story of Indian Cricket. He's another of the regular features here at the Kushwant Singh Literary Festival in London. But today they're talking about Geoffrey Archer's most recent book, Over My Dead Body, which features his detective sergeant, William Warwick of the London Met. The London Met, perhaps now as well known around the world as they are to us here in London itself. So a big welcome to Lord Geoffrey Archer and Mihir Bose. Well, it's a great pleasure talking to Geoffrey Archer. Um, who's in Spain. I'm in London in my loft here in Shepherd's Bush. Um, Jeffrey is breaking into his siesta to talk to us. Um, Jeffrey, um, before I begin, let me tell you a little anecdote um, which took place um, over lunch um, where my dear wife read me out from um, your book, Over My Dead Body, the exchange between your detective, um, Chief Inspector William Warwick and James Buchanan. Um, and in fact, she played the audible version of, of it and uh, the exchange of James Buchanan being a young man who doesn't um, want to be the president of America or anything like that because he wants to be the head of the FBI and can get direct access to the president. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating. And at, the, and at the end of it, she said, this is an absolute page turner. Um, she was the first one in the family to read it, may I say. And um, this is in the same class as Dick. Francis. There can be no higher praise for my wife than that. She's into equestrian sport and Dick Francis books are the one books I cannot take to the charity shop despite my great desire to reduce the number of books in my in my in my house. Now um, the way you you actually let's talk about that conversation because it's at the start of this book. The way you frame it is is so fascinating and uh, as you were writing it what was going through your mind when you were writing it as the opening opening lines of your book? Well, one of the problems uh, one has if you're doing several books with the same characters, and it's not a sequel, uh, you can pick up any of the books uh, and they should work in their own right. But one of the problems is you need an opening that will capture the reader's imagination. And I decided to put my hero, William Warwick, and his remarkable wife, Beth, on holiday. I then decided to put them on a ship. Now, I, we've discussed this before in the past, Mahir, and I don't know where I'm going. So when I put him on the ship and I had her going to her Pilates class in the morning and him sitting having a drink looking out to sea, along comes a young man who's hoping to go to Harvard, but has already worked out that this man is a detective. And because after Harvard, he wants to join the FBI, he decides, he says to the, can I, can I sit with you? And William says, yes. And they have that conversation where the young man says, you're not a bank manager. You're not a taxi driver. What's amazing is you're a detective, but what's a detective doing in first class? Now, the writer, or in my case, 
I take that to where, and I just follow where it's going. So the answer to your question is, along came the young man, James Buchanan. I then decided that he would be the son, the grandson of the owner of the ship. I then decided that his grandfather, Hamish Buchanan, would be murdered on the ship. And immediately the two of them, the grandson, just waiting to go up to Harvard, and this incredible detective, William Warwick, would solve the mystery of who had murdered the owner of the ship. But, Maya, I then had to have a triple twist once they had. You described how you don't know where you're going. So when you're now in the middle of writing your next book, as you always do, you go to Spain and you write in blocks. When you set out to write, do you sketch out a plan of the basic outline of the book or does it begin with, with, a, with a blank screen and then you say, right, William Warwick sets off. How, how does it work? Well, I've decided initially that William on leaving school would go into the Metropolitan Police and each book he would be, he would conquer, conquer, he would be involved in a different kind of crime and he would be a different rank. So book one, he's a detective constable dealing with art fraud. In book two, he becomes a sergeant and is dealing with drugs. In book three, he becomes an inspector and is dealing with police protect, uh, sorry, it's dealing uh, with um, police corruption. In book four, the one you have in front of you, he's a chief inspector and he's dealing with murder. Now to answer your question, I am sitting over in my office on the other side uh, of the house and I am into royalty protection because he's moved up to superintendent. So each book, will have a new rank and each book will have a new subject. And if I can live to the age of 85, because I'm 82, Mayor, if I can live... I thought you the, were 55. Well, I'll, let's pass at 55, quite right. I, I will. He will become the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And I will have done eight books, taking him from Constable on the Beat to commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And in each book, he will tackle a different type of crime. Right. You've sketched it out very well. And you said you don't know where it will take you. But sometimes do your characters take you to places you don't want to go uh, or make you uncomfortable? Very good question. I can give you an example in the Clifton Chronicles where the wicked Lady Virginia, I was determined to get rid of the wicked Lady Virginia or do her down and she's in the witness box, and she's up against my heroine, uh, Emma, who's Emma Clifton, and uh, there is a legal battle between them. So, of course, I want Emma to win. And the morning I got out of bed that morning, I'm going to kill Virginia, and I'm going to, Emma is going to win. And Virginia gets into the witness box up against the leading QC, one of Britain's leading QCs, and he asks a question. And I wrote the question down, Mahir. I wrote the question down. And then the answer was, if you can't do better than that, I should try again. And she, <laughs> and I, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, okay, well, I've got to move on to the next question. So I wrote the next line, and she bashes that one back. And by the end of the five pages of the cross-examination, she had killed the QC, which was exactly opposite to what I intended when I got up at six o'clock that morning. So the answer to your question is, it goes where it takes me. So in, in effect, your characters can take you over in that sense. Oh, very much indeed. And some become more powerful and more interesting. I remember uh, when I wrote The Prodigal Daughter, the story of the first woman president of the United States, and still, Maya, they haven't woken up and had one. And I wrote the story of the first woman president of the United States. I decided that um, Abel Rosnowski's daughter, Florentina, would have to have, living in New York, would have to have an English tutor, an English teacher. And she, ha she has this uh, uh, amazing Miss Treadgold, 
and Miss Treadgold comes over, and I got her in my mind, Mia, for five pages maximum. In she comes, does her job, gets out. 173 pages later, <laughs> she gets back on the boat and goes home. So you're yes, quite sir. right. I go where they take me. And and in, in that process of going where they take you, have you had uncomfortable journeys? Yes, because uh, sometimes, as in the case of Lady Virginia, you want to get rid of them. I mean, I had a bit of problem with this because the publishers kept saying, everybody loves Lady Virginia. And I said, well, I rather like to get rid of her. No, no, you have to keep her. So yes, you do sometimes. And there was a case in, I wrote a book, uh, As the Crow Flies, where my he hero, Charlie Trumper, born in the East End of London as a barrow boy, uh, and the story, it's a simple story. When you say, do you know where you're going? I knew he was going to be a barrow boy in the East End of London and would end up in the House of Lords. That's all I knew. And uh, yes, I did in that particular book have a major problem because uh, it took me to where he needed to find something out in order to save his life, his fortune, everything. And he knew there was one person alive who could give him that answer. And she was in a nursing home in Australia. So he gets on a plane, he goes to Australia, he gets to the nursing home, the door is open, and he says to the matron, I've come to see Mrs. So-and-so. And, -so. and uh, she says, well, I'm very, very sorry. She died last week. Now, I had to get myself out of that problem because I liked the idea that after all his fighting to find out the thing that would save him, he was smashed at the last moment. And my very, very great editor of many years ago, ago no, now no longer with us, the great Corley Smith, who edited J.D. Salinger, a truly great editor, said, Jeffrey, if you've got a problem like that, don't avoid it. The problem will not be solved by the reader. It has to be solved by you. Don't find the easy way out, Is w w in which case the matron would have said, oh, yes, do come in. I'll take you to her. That's the easy way out. He said, you've stuffed yourself. Now get yourself out of that corner. And I walked around a golf course for three days. Huh trying to work out how, and then I got it. You get it sometimes, Maya, in a second, in a split second it comes. You get the basic idea, and then it takes a couple more hours perhaps to see how you use that basic idea. And it was very simple indeed. I turned her into a, a Scottish matron, and she said, as you've come all this way, would you be kind enough to take this letter back to England? because it will save the post. So she hands him the letter and he reads the letter on the plane and everything is explained. So tell me, what is it about writers like you um, who want to kill one of their characters? And I'm thinking, well, even kill their leading character. And I'm thinking about um, Arthur Conan Doyle actually killing Sherlock Holmes, then resurrecting him. Uh, Agatha Christie giving Poirot a last role. What is it? Is it that you get tired of it? Is it that you feel, oh, I've had enough of him. He's invaded my space. What is it? I mean, you, the, the character almost becomes a human being who's with you. Well, we know in the case of uh, Agatha Christie and in the case of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, we know historically that their publishers went down to their house, sat with them and said, the public want them alive. And he pointed out that they're dead. In the case of Conan Doyle, he, pointed out, he said, well, revive him. And he did. And in the case of, uh, and the, it's even funnier with Poirot, in my view, and I've discussed this with that wonderful actor, David Suchet. We were at the same school and, uh, and are friends. And we, I discussed it with him. It's almost more fascinating with uh, uh, playing uh, Poirot, because if you look carefully, Mahir, and you mustn't look carefully, he's about 130 on his last page. <laughs> <laughs> he's been around forever. And because the public loved him, she kept him going. But I don't know how many books there are, 50, 60 of them. And he couldn't have done all those cases in 20 years. <laughs> but, but 
what a wonderful character. And yes, now in my own case, uh, yes, I felt originally with the Clifton Chronicles, it was good for three books. And then uh, I got them to three books and they were only 40. So the publisher said, for heaven's sake, keep going. So I then got to five books and they were around 60 and I could see the ending. I could see that uh, I could see that Harry would eventually die and write his last book. Uh, and I could see that that uh, Emma was going to become a government minister, a woman government minister in a conservative government. Uh, and I could see all that. And that got me to into the 70s. Now, the problem with the 70s, when they get to the 70s, you're not meant to be doing as much as you used to do. So, frankly, seven books was enough. I got to the end. I thought I was very happy uh, when it was the end of the seven books. But in answer to your question, that was originally meant to be three books. Uh, we talked about Agatha Christie and, and, and uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. What is interesting about them is that their central detective character actually is always somebody who proves Scotland Yard detectives to be idiots. Poirot is infinitely superior to Inspector Jap. Sherlock Holmes is, um, you know, the detective hardly features. He's that individual loner. Poirot is actually an extraordinary character in the, in the sense that the Belgium comes over and teaches the English how to be a detective. In your case, what you've done is you've made a Scotland Yard detective into the central figure. And in a way, you are, you are treading a very different line to, mm. the, to those to those detective fiction writers who who were you know who've been part of the British tradition for almost a hundred years, were you were you aware when you started because detective fiction is not the first thing you wrote when you started on this that you were doing something that if you like the great genre of detective fiction writing in Britain hasn't done. Well, uh, it's kind of you to say so, and indeed, the head of the crime club in England said uh, that the idea of a detective going from uh, constable to uh, commissioner in eight books and having eight different crimes to solve, eight different types of crimes, he said, I cannot think why it hasn't been thought of years ago. This was the head of the crime. Why? And, and the, the truth is, I did want to go down a different route. And I did like the idea of this very clever young man saying to his father, a distinguished QC, no, I'm not going to read law at Cambridge. I'm going to go to London University and I'm going to uh, become a, a constable on the beat. So that was the route I was going. And I hadn't thought of it quite in the way you've expressed it. But uh, actually, now you've said it that way, May, I'm rather glad <laughs> that uh, I went down a completely different route. Now, the detective in question is based on a man called uh, Detective Chief Superintendent John Sutherland, who was head of the murder squad uh, and uh, sadly had a mental breakdown in what he described himself in his brilliant book uh, as one murder too many. Now, I met him at an Advent carol service in London for the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and he was reading one of the lessons. And I had a word with him afterwards and said, look, I'm just starting these books about William Warwick. And as far as I can see, you are William Warwick. <laughs> and uh, you've had a brilliant career. You got to chief, detective chief superintendent before you were 40. Absolutely remarkable. And uh, will you be my chief researcher? And he turned me down because he said he was recovering, quite rightly, recovering from this terrible experience. And I, I got halfway through. And then I rang him up, I don't know, six, nine months later and said, do you feel any different? He said, yeah, I feel a lot better, he said, and I'd rather like to take up the challenge. So when I finished about the fifth or sixth draft, I send it to him and a remarkable lady called Detective Sergeant Michelle Roycroft, who was in the drug squad uh, for 25 years and is retired as well. And they both get the fifth or sixth draft. And what they do is they correct silly mistakes. Give you an example of one this afternoon, Mayor. One this afternoon, where I've, I'm now on the seventh, eighth, and ninth draft, so I've got their remarks. And they will change perhaps just one word. For example, I said at the end of one thing, 
and uh, you will do X and Y. And they said, no, no, you have to put the words, he was cautioned, not he had the rights read out to him. I read he had his right. He said, no, that's American. You've got to say he was arrested and then cautioned. So those four words were changed to arrested and cautioned because reading out his rights was not correct. So it's an example of something that happened this afternoon where I changed four words. So they're always looking because if you get it wrong, I'll get thousands of emails saying, dear Jeffrey, you don't know the difference between America and Britain. It's time you took up your research a bit more seriously. So I'm very lucky to have these two remarkable former police officers who uh, do just that just occasionally, if I'm very lucky, they come up with an anecdote as well that has happened in their life. The best one I ever remember, and I haven't been able to use yet, and I know it to be true, but I haven't been able to use it, is Michel, who's about, I don't know, five foot eight, uh, now a former officer. She told me of a case where she was chasing a, a drug baron and dived into the top of the roof of his car and stopped him driving. Well, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have had the guts to do that. Count me out on that one, but she clearly did it. And I haven't yet been able to get it into a book. Well, you clearly share with another great British writer, Somerset Maugham, who said you've got to constantly polish your work. So, I mean, you know, the, the drafts have to go on and on. But is there a process where you say, um, no, it's got to stop now, or, or you, you are, when you submit the manuscript, or TypeScript to your publisher, you finally feel it can't be bettered? It's a very interesting question, because when you say can't be bettered, it, you can only do as well as you can do. Someone else may feel even then it's not good yeah. enough. That's fine. You must do the best you can do, which is why I go on to about 14 drafts. And if someone says, well, it's not very good, Jeffrey, that's fine. I can't do any best. I have to tell myself it's the best. I can do. Now, in the case of Somerset Maugham, you raise a very in, in, interesting case there. And I thought he was a great writer, by the way. I was brought up to I, believe. I know he's, nobody I, remembers him now. Well, it's sad because I think The Bell Ringer is a yeah. masterpiece. Yeah. And, and The think, Rain as a short story is one of the uh, great beautiful, short stories. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And Mr. Noel is yeah. terrific, terrific. So I learned a lot from him. I've written 92 short stories myself and consider him. H. H. Munro, Saki, uh, um, Maupassant, yeah. O'Henry. I think these are the great short story writers. Now, in your own country, of course, I include an absolute giant in R. K. Narayan. I think oh, he's yeah. one of the great short story writers of all time. And how he didn't get the Nobel Prize is a comment <laughs> on the Nobel Prize committee, not on Mr. R. K. Narayan. His Ability to take an unimportant tax collector living in a small village in India and bring him to life and demand you turn the pages to find out what this insignificant man has been up to is close to genius. But I mean, you started off not by writing detective fiction. You started off and, and you know, your, your famous first novel, Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less. Um, when you started that, were you thinking that this is where you would end up? Were you imagining? Were you were you were you hoping? What what was your ambition? What would you have then said? I've done well. It's a very fair question because after that, that hold your breath, Mahir. That they if sixteen publishers turned down, not really? a penny, not a penny less. The seventeenth publisher, Jonathan Cape managed 3,000 copies in hardback, and they only just sold. And my wife said, isn't it time you got a proper job? <laughs> and But it all changed when uh, I wrote Cain and Abel. The whole world changed for me when I, I and now in your country, I see the, uh, I see the Indian Times think 100 million people have read Cain and Abel yeah. in India. It seems well, impossible, but in, in, sorry, 50 million in India, 100 million in the whole world. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you you you've always been a great uh, story writer. You can tell a story, which is which is what it's all about, and you can tell it, and you can make believable characters where you believe that these people are there next to you. You know that that's been your your great great virtue, great ability, or right from the right from the beginning. I remember speaking to Richard Cohen about you, who edited your books, and what a great story writer you were, what a great storyteller you were, which is not a gift many people have. And and we were talking about Somerset Maugham. I think Somerset Maugham had that had that capability. Yeah, but that's, but, that's the point, if I may interrupt you, Mayor. You're making the point yourself. It's a gift, to use your words. It's a gift. You can't pop down to Marks and Spencer's <laughs> and order a couple of stories. It's a gift, like playing the violin, like being an opera singer, like being an Olympic athlete. It's a gift. Did you always have it as a child? Well, I was always, I think, a raconteur, and I've always loved public speaking. So I wasn't aware that I had it until I put pen to paper. And what made you, I mean, you, you've written a range of things. You've written short stories, you've written plays. Um, you know, normally writers, uh, if they're successful, stick to one genre. What made you diversify in such a way? Well, I love the theatre. I go to theatre, uh, when I'm in London, I'll go to the theatre twice a week. I'm a big theatre fan. Uh, I can even tell you the two shows I saw the week before I flew out to Spain. That's how much I can even tell you the show I'm going to see the day I fly back. And that's how much I love the theatre. So writing three plays was quite natural. But don't forget, Mahir, I'm 82 years old. I've had a long enough life to experiment with other forms of writing. One point, your blurb in your book mentions your great interests, talks about your passionate interest in arts, but it doesn't mention an interest of yours that I'm very well aware of, and that is where we've always met, your interest in sport, in cricket. The point I'm trying to make to you here is does this not reflect something I've lived in England now half a century, and it's always struck me, and this is even more true of India, who are Indians are even more pedantic um, than the British ever will be. And and um, that there is this difference between arties and hearties, which is not true in America. One of my favorite, all-time favorite authors is David Halberstam, who a great New York Times journalist, sadly died in a, in a car crash, wrote some brilliant books, who actually wrote a book on baseball, covered baseball. Do you feel that in Britain, Despite the fact that um, you support a minor county, Somerset, not Surrey, the great greatest count, cricket county in the in the world, but do you feel that because of the fact that you know you you there is a difference between arties and hearties, and to a certain extent, you have not had the sort of attention on the literary pages that you should have had. Well, it's very kind of you to say so, and I remember sitting with you at Lords and you discussing this in a very serious way. And I have never forgot that you said very kindly, I told my wife that night, uh, I reported back to my wife that night, you said I did deserve to be treated in the same way as some of the giants of the past. I've never forgotten that. It was very kind of you. But the answer well, that is true. It's very kind. I, 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 I asked your cricket point. <sighs> I love cricket. I write about, I've written some short stories on cricket and I've included it in the occasional novel. Uh, but uh, not least in the latest one, um, it's included. But uh, a whole book on cricket. It's like Indians very kindly come up to me in the street and say, we want your great Indian novel. And I say, wait a moment, I'm an Englishman. If, you, if I wrote, tried to write the great English novel, you'd fall about laughing. I said, I love the Indians and I come as often as I can. And of course, I sit with idiots like you because you and I are as mad about cricket I mean, we both we both have this passion for cricket, and God help us when we sit next together when England are playing India. I avoid you when India are playing <laughs> India, uh, but I don't feel confident enough, Mayor, to actually write a book on cricket. And don't forget, you've spent your life as one of the leading sports writers, and you've 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 written books, amazing books on the history of Indian cricket. So I might equally say to you, where's your novel? 
<laughs> I, I started off wanting to be a novelist, but I couldn't write, I couldn't create a character. But the point is, what, what the point here is that you have therefore, had you been an American, you would have been um, not treated on the literary pages as if you were just a, 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 a right. popular fiction writer. That's the point I'm trying to get at. Yes, I think you're right. I, it's kind of you to say so. I've won awards in France, in Italy, in the United States and Ireland. I've never won anything in England. I mean, and that that is a reflection of England. And, and you know, as I said, in India, it's even more so because I think the pedantry in India is such, you know, I, I find myself in India um, because I've written history books as well and not just sports books because I'm not an academic. The academics say, well, you know, your, your oh, books have not been peer, peer reviewed. But that that is a that is an that is an a Indian story. Let's let's talk a bit about um, what you you've had a multifaceted career you've been a politician you're still a member of the house of lords what took you into writing what made you decide that you would become a writer i know mm. everybody says there's a writer in everybody but fortunately not everybody writes <laughs> so what made you think that you wanted to write and be that you could be a writer what gave you that strength inner strength it was a mistake Mayor. i was <laughs> really? a member of the british house of commons I entered the house at far too young an age. I entered at 29, assumed I was going to be prime minister. What was going to stop me? Made a complete bloody fall of myself, investing in a company called Aquablast, where I lost everything I'd put in and lost some borrowed money as well. I left the house when the election came up. I couldn't get a job. And I sat down and wrote, not a penny more, not a penny less thinking it was an interesting story for young men who've lost their fortune and between them decide to steal it back. But they mustn't go over the top because that would be stealing. They're only allowed to take exactly what's been stolen from them. And I suppose I was silly enough to think it would be a bestseller. So I rushed down on the day it was published to get my Sunday Times. Very disappointed I wasn't in the top 10. I rushed down the following week, very disappointed to find I was in not in the top 10. Uh, and they refused to tell me that I actually wasn't in the top 100. <laughs> so I think going on was the was the tough decision. And I say to young writers now, I didn't make it until my third book. Don't assume you'll be a bestseller with your third book. The public have got to get to know you and trust you. And if that works, you will grow and grow and grow. A few years ago, it was said that book writing is dead, is dying. You know, the young generation don't. My my daughter, for instance, um, though I've been a journalist, doesn't doesn't read um, hard printed copies of papers. I can't do without hard printed copies of papers. And and I might say that the first thing I turn to is the back pages, the sports pages. That's what I grew up with before I come to the rest of the paper. But <laughs> But 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 do you now? The pandemic seems to suggest that book book reading has increased. That the book sales have gone up. That people actually want hard hard copy. How do you see the book trade as as a writer, as such a as such a well established writer selling so many copies? Do you ever see people not buying uh, copies of books? I hope not. The other point you make is a fascinating one, because you're quite right. During the two years when we were all locked up, I certainly bought more books and read more books than I ever have done. But there's still damn good value for money, uh, and which is a start. And I, I think the answer to your question is what you said as a fact, book sales have not gone down. So I'm rather hoping you're right. I confess that people aren't reading books the length they used to be. And I always give the example that The Count of Monte Cristo is about 1,700 pages. And there are still people writing books that are eight or 900 pages, whereas it looks as if the general public now want to read books that are somewhere between three and 400 pages. But I think for sheer entertainment, you do get seven, eight, nine, ten hours, which you don't get in a film. You don't get and in you a play. 
and I think I prefer, I know a friend of mine read Kindle, but I still prefer a hard copy that you can oh, go yeah. back to. And, oh, yeah. and, and talking of weighty books, I mean, and you're part of that great classic generation of, of British writers, you know, Dickens would not would not care about how big the book was. But his books were, of course, um, published in, in book form after they'd been serialized in, in, in various magazines. Well, your point is well made, because if you look at... Um... If you if you look at what an oblique house that's probably 700 pages but if you look at the, the book that's actually sold more than any of his his wonderful a tale of two cities i think it's about 250 pages and i'm glad to hear you put it that way i'd never quite put it that way myself he darn well did what he wanted to do and the public didn't mind because the, he was a genius uh, that's a very interesting point you make that he he just did what he wanted to do. And uh, certainly he's the greatest writer, storyteller uh, in the history of uh, my country. Um, and uh, he's still, and what's wonderful about him is he translates onto the screen. So one, I love a Dickens story on a screen. And I must say, a Tale of Two Cities for me, I read it a long time ago, is one of the greatest novels I've, I've ever read, the way it ends and, and, and the way it goes on. But tell me, who is the writer, when you were growing up, who's the writer that inspired you most, the one that you turned to and said, this, this man, or if it was a woman, is absolutely brilliant? Well, my mother was a, a journalist and she made me read when I was young. I was actually more interested in captaining the England cricket team. <laughs> it was a minor disadvantage that I couldn't bat, bowl or field, but my mother kept me at it. And I would say I, I began, uh, began uh, and you're almost old enough, Mahia, to remember, I, I began with Richmond Compton and so the William books yeah. were wonderful for me. Uh, and then I moved on. I, I suppose as a young man, Ian Fleming, damn good storyteller, again, underrated as a writer. They all try to do what he's doing, but they don't succeed. He, his books are amazing. But in old age, and you must tell me yours so that I can read them tonight. In old age, and by that I mean 60, and I'm now 82. In old age, I fell in love with Stefan Zweig. Oh, what? I think Beware of Pity is a masterpiece. And indeed, you as a nonfiction writer will oh. greatly admire his nonfiction work because he's yeah. that genius who can do both. It's, uh, you mentioned Stephen Swig. You know, he's he's. He, uh, uh, I once got um, uh, Roy Hodgson, who's written the foreword to my book that's just come out on sport and race, to come and speak at the Reform Club. Roy, of course, made the mistake of becoming a member of the Garrick, but that's a different story. And when we asked him what was his um, no, no, favorite, no, 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 no. <laughs> you misheard me, Mahir. No, no, no. Huh. Stefan Zweig. Yes, Stephen Zweig. Yes, and oh. and 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 Roy Hodgson thought he was he was the best writer. You know, his favorite his favorite novel novelist. Who so, did? Sorry, as Roy Hodgson, the England football did he? manager. Did he? So, well, so, he's so, you know. and he's a very intelligent man, isn't he? You, yes, uh, you yes. talk about. I talk about my love of the theatre. The only time I, I ever see Roy is at the theatre. He loves the theatre, yeah. and he's yeah, very that's... he's very well read. Uh, he's Absolutely. A, and a thoroughly and then, nice chap. And when he mentioned his name, there were some members of the Reform Club who hadn't, you know, who hadn't really read his books and things like that. And um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned William books because um, though I was brought up in India, I was brought up on English literature and I read Biggles and and um, uh, William books were... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant books were given to me by my, um, my, 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 the man I call my grandfather, he was my father's uncle, and I came to England thinking everybody had a cook, so I take it you grew up with, with um, having a cook in your house, I, I take it, Geoffrey. Um, um, but surely, okay. surely, as a good Indian, you were brought up on P.G. Woodhouse. Absolutely, P.G. Woodhouse. I mean, I, I thought everybody in England um, had had a had a valet who who served fish every day. But uh, there we are. Um, um, now, uh, tell me, you um, you've spoken about cricket. Um, would you have given up all your success to have played for England and scored a century at Lords? It's a very hard question to answer because I remember a very intelligent man saying to me when I was a young man, when you achieve something, you want something different. 
And if you had that something different, you'd want what you had achieved. I'd love to have scored a century at Lords. If you're asking me to give up all the books to play for one century at Lords, no. If you ask me, would you like to be Raoul Dravid? The answer is yes, because he's the most beautiful stroke player I think I've ever seen. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Gavaskar, and of course, we all admire Tendulkar. But Dravid, for me, and that day when he and VS, VVS Laxman yeah. held on against the Australians. I mean, you, you, my love of cricket is proved by the fact that I look upon that as an Englishman, yeah. as one of the great days in the history of cricket. Yeah. So, no, I'd like to have been a prime minister. I'd like to have been captain of the England cricket team. And I'd like to have had seven number ones on the New York Times. Well, I'll settle for one of those. <laughs> Well, funnily, you mentioned Gavaskar. I went to school with him. I was a couple of years his senior. And I remember um, um, as a sort of, you know, a boy in senior school looking down on this little boy in, in shorts, practicing um, his forward defensive. And, and we laughed at him. And we went to a Jesuit school. And Father Fritz, who took us for English and, 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 and sports, said, that boy will play for India. You load of washouts you don't know, which, which turned out to be true. Now, we talked and a bit about actually, politics. Actually, his name came up at lunch today day if you had to send a batsman to the crease when you were in trouble who would it be and i said without hesitation sunil gavaskar oh yes he's, he's a, and he's a very nice guy as well he's a very yeah, straightforward he's guy he's, he's, yeah. he's a very nice guy talking of politics you were involved in politics you're still involved in politics Politics, in particularly what is happening with um, in, in, in recent times with members of parliament and the stories that are coming out, suggests that the people who are of good caliber are not going into politics. Would you accept that? And if that is the case, why is that the case? One thinks of, you know, the best people in the land should be going into politics. That's not just true of Britain. It's true of other countries. You think of America, you think of India. Why is it that it is not attracting the, the, the best and the good? I can best describe this when I was asked some time ago to speak. Uh, so it's not right up to date, but 15 years ago, I was asked to speak to the Kit Kat Club in England, where, which is for women who've achieved managing director, chairman or chief executive before the age of 40. And the mayor, the Lord Mayor rang me up and said, we want you to address them, Geoffrey. And I couldn't think. I was in heaven, my head. I mean, 200 women in one room, all of them cleverer than me. I was in heaven. And off I go. And I and there was one particular girl I will never forget, lady and woman, I will never forget the rest of my life. She's standing at the back and she's having a row with me on a big political subject at the time. And I suddenly had enough of it and said, why don't you go into the House of Commons? Why don't you serve your country? Why don't you play a part in politics? And she said, Jeffrey, I earn a quarter of a million pounds a year and I have two boyfriends at the moment and don't want to see either of their names on the front page of the Daily Mail. And I think that answers your question. But has it, is, is this a fault, perhaps, of my tribe journalism that we are now reporting more personal stories than we used to. When I went into in, into journalism all those years ago, and I qualified as a chartered accountant, my father said there's no money in journalism. He was right. But the point is that that stage, what, what was in the private life of individuals was not something that you cared about. You cared about what the policies were, what the issues were. Is, is this because we have trivialized, our world is more trivialized than it was when we were young? Well, if that is true, Mahir, it's because that is what the public want. The journalist can't write an article that no one wants to read. And if we, in England at the moment, we've got Wayne Rooney in court mm -hmm. against Vardy, and it's on the front pages every day. I happen to think, on, and it's getting about the same coverage as Ukraine. Well, there is a subtle difference in its importance. <laughs> Uh, uh, but that's the world we now live in. Celebrity, TikTok, all these things. It's, it's a new world that you and I don't fully understand. But now taking your own comment about your own profession. Wow. When I was at Oxford, you know, the very best people wanted to be journalists. Nowadays, it's very hard to get a job 
in journalism. The newspapers are not selling, as you well know. The numbers are going down. Uh, newscasts on television are lucky if they get 40,000 people watching them. Very lucky. And so your world has changed as well. And you make the point when you were a young man, going into journalism was a big deal. It's not that attractive at the moment. But, I mean, this, of course, is, is, is part of a changing world that we can't do anything about. Do you feel, looking back, that you have lived in the best of times? Or would you have liked to be a young man now at 18? Oh, well, I'd like to be a young man now, only because I'm an old man now. But uh, I have a wonderful housekeeper called Lena. She's Bulgarian, and she's, I'm guessing, 24 years old. And uh, she saw a picture of Mary and myself in my Oxford days when I was a runner. <clears throat> she saw a picture of that and she said, how wonderful. And I thought she was referring to the fact that we were two young people at Oxford. She wasn't because I asked her to say, what do you mean? And she said, oh, wonderful to have been born after the Second World War and before COVID. And that I thought was very interesting. And I asked her to go on. And what she was clearly saying was a young person nowadays lives in a very, very changing world, a very dangerous world. And actually, to, I think the words you used were a, a golden age, perhaps between 1950 and 2000, 2010, perhaps that was a golden age. And we're also living in a much more polarized world where, yeah. you know, if you're if you're not with me, you're against me. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I could can should have different views and still be able to I sit down together. You and I have had rows in the box. It doesn't stop us being friends. But nowadays, you're quite right. If you're on one side of that, what about the middle? There's, there should be a middle where you are, you are um, and but, ooh, uh, um, not you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm right. I, I hate that. I hate it. When you're not writing, and I know we've discussed this, you write in two hour writing blocks, what are you reading? Are you reading something or listening to music? What are you doing to get away from, from the computer when, when you're not composing? Well, I confess that I don't read a great deal when I'm writing. I do read a great deal when I go back to London or to Cambridge. I do read a lot uh, and love reading. I've a tendency more to, I hope, watch what I call good television. Uh, watch something that will truly entertain me. And, uh, and I can give you some, I can give you some examples I've been loving and I hope you've seen it. I've been loving Call My Agent, the French. Oh, yes. I think. So that sort of thing for me in the evening is a lovely getaway. But I, I would be bound to add that I have been um, overwhelmed by Ukraine. And I have been watching the news even more than I usually do. And the delight of seeing those very brave people fight to save their nation and just the belief I, I i read more carefully the reports that are coming out of the ministry of defense because they're not prejudiced they're not on the russian side they're not on the ukrainian side they're giving you a report so when they said as they did this morning that they now believe that the russians can be pushed back to the border and it may be impossible for them to mount this sort of operation again, certainly in the near future. And you add to that the Swedish and the Finnish joining NATO. That has had me as glued as any any book. Well, I, I must say, I mean, what is happening in Ukraine is dreadful. What the Russians are doing are dreadful. But in a way, it has it has given the British press the chance to to have foreign press coverage. Because the one thing that I have noticed is oh. is the decline in foreign press coverage. British press used to have the best foreign press coverage historically, and over the years they have reduced it for cost reasons and 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 so on. Now, an tell me, statement. no, no, that's an interesting statement. We have the best foreign affairs coverage in the world, in your view? Well, 
I mean, I'm talking of historically, you know, yeah. if you go back, yes, the New York Times was very good. But the trouble yeah. with the New York Times was that you started a you sto story on the opening page and you found you were reading five pages of it, whereas the British oh, yeah. British press had the ability to synthesize. And they yeah. had, I mean, my hero was James Cameron, who was one of the great oh. foreign reporters this country has produced. Wonderful. I mean, what has happened is foreign press coverage, I'm talking across the board, not just in the Times oh, or the Guardian, no. has, has declined. But tell me, who is your greatest critic? Your wife, or who is it? Who's the one who reads and says, yeah, Jeffrey, this Mary. will not work? <laughs> Mary's useless uh, because she's a scientist. As you know, she's chairman of the Science Museum, the first woman ever to chair a national museum or gallery. So she's useless. She's very good because she's well educated. She's very good on commas and full stops. But she writes, being a scientist, everything has to be so accurate and so careful. <laughs> Uh, but yes, so she reads late editions. No, do you know, I'm going to tell you something that may shock even an old pro like you. They've recently done a survey on critics, writing critics. Mm. And I read it very carefully. And it said the public have stopped believing critics because they either favor a friend or whatever they do, mm -hmm. or they hit someone. They now tell me, and it's all in this survey, it's the public who make the decision. So if you get a five-star review from a member of the public saying, I can't put it down, or you get a critic saying, well, he's not really a literary writer, is he? <laughs> it's the public who win. And that is one of the big changes. So I cruelly test myself in a very simple way. I look at what marks I get on Kindle, and I consider 4.5 wonderful. I can, I've, I'm very proud to tell you I've never been below four. And I consider how many reviews you get important. It tells you what the public are thinking. And you can judge one book against another. You can judge yourself against other authors. And if you've had 15,000 reviews, the percentage stays constant because if, 20 people hate you or 20 people love you. It makes no difference. So that is how I let the public decide. Which is your, of your books, which is the one you like most? Like most? The public have decided Cain and Abel by, I mean, by miles. I, I'm sentimental about not a penny more, not a penny less. But the critics who you and I have been critical of <laughs> uh, say Paths of Glory. The story of Mallory wanting to conquer Everest is the best thing I've ever done. But I come back, may I let the public decide. And which one was the most difficult? Oh, I think undoubtedly uh, Paths of Glory, because I was taking a real human being who wanted, uh, when he was in 1924, think of Chariots of Fire, same year, he yeah. wanted to conquer this mountain called Everest. He was in a three-piece suit with a rolled umbrella, very British, didn't know where he was going. We know he got within 700 feet because his body was found. Yeah. 700, but we don't know if he was going up or coming down. So to keep to the authentic truth of that great man, but give it an ending, that was a real challenge. And what would you like to be remembered for? As a storyteller. Yes, I've, uh, I'm very proud of my charity work and my auctioneering. But if, if, if you mean, is there one book I'd like to remember or be remembered for? I'd like to be, think I was a storyteller. And, uh, and if I was talking to an Indian or why I was in India, I would say I'd like to be remembered as a great cricketer. <laughs> and fun final question, um, comparing your British public with your Indian public, what is the difference? Well, one of the great moments in my life uh, was the Jaipur Festival, when 8,500 Indians came to hear me speak and I burst into tears. I, I was so shocked. An Englishman uh, crying in India, unheard of. Unheard of. I burst into tears. <laughs> so when it was that was something I won't forget the rest of my life. I don't draw crowds like anywhere near that in any other country in the world. So India holds a very special 
place for me and always will. I, I, I was having a real go. Uh, my new man dealing with my gardener is a Sikh. And I was having a real go at him because he wasn't wearing a turban. <laughs> and he said, well, that's what my father says. And we're moving on. But I think of Indians as being ambitious, hardworking, and straight. And I love dealing with them, always have done. And certainly they're playing a major role in Britain. Well, Geoffrey, thank you very much. We shall, of course, probably meet when India play England at Old Trafford. And, uh, of course, uh, we shall have different uh, views on where the, what the result will be. But on that <laughs> note, thank you very much, Geoffrey. Thank you very much. Lovely to see you again. And look forward to seeing you at Lords or the Oval. Absolutely. Well, thank you, both of you, for such a wonderful and exciting discussion there. Um, really great. Um, both of you are such prolific authors, of course, um, and I've just noticed that Mahir has another book out. I mean, extraordinary, right? It's almost faster than we can read, uh, called Dreaming the Impossible, The Battle to Create a Non-Racial Sports World. Um, I was also just reminding everybody that one of the great themes of this apart from the crossing borders, which we've covered nicely today, is the theme of ecology and the tree planting, which is part of the, of the legacy of this festival. And this year, there are trees for tigers being planted in Sundarbans National Park in West Bengal, one for each of the speakers at the conference. Maybe next time one of you might be writing about the Sundarbans and West Bengal and perhaps we could have our detective from the Met turning up and uh, tracking tiger smuggling. Just a little suggestion from my part anyway for another book. Thank you both so much for contributing to this festival and keeping the legacy of Kushwant Singh alive. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Kushwant Singh Literary Festival London. I'm sure many of you will have been here on earlier occasions when we've gathered in London in person um, to celebrate the life and work of Kushwant Singh. But even online, I think we can still have some real flavour of him and his work and his times, perhaps. Um, and welcome to you all. So, the, the Literary Festival is to promote the legacy of Kushwant Singh, who was an author, a scholar, journalist and iconoclast, and we discuss the values he stood for and address his concerns. London is a place where we do this because he worked and studied here, and this shaped many of his ideas in his later life. He's interested in a closer ties between India and Pakistan, equal opportunities for women, and disseminating values of democracy, tolerance, and compassion. And one of his major concerns was also ecology. And in the festival, we give all the speakers um, a, a certificate about planting a tree for them in the Sundarbans area of West Bengal. Now, this leads me on very nicely to today's talk between Professor Wendy Doniger and Professor Arshia Sutter, who are two old friends of mine, and I very much wish that we could welcome them in person to London today. In fact, the last time we all met was here in London, though we met on many continents before. Um, Arshia Sutter, you probably know from her work on translations. Um, she was Wendy's student in the 1980s, um, at the University of Chicago, where she did a PhD in South Asian languages and civilization. And her major work has been in the epics, um, particularly her translations of the Ramayana, though she's also translated the Kata Saritsagra, 
and many other texts. And many of you will also know her work, um, her work writing shorter pieces in magazines and newspapers and online in India. So she's an ideal person to be talking to Professor Wendy Doniger, who in the manner of all eminent people has given me a ridiculously short CV here, which doesn't <laughs> do anything to encapsulate um, her great contribution to the world of South Asian studies and storytelling more widely. So many books with so many titles that I can hardly begin um, to mention them, although I remember being fascinated them when I, by them when I was an undergraduate many years ago, as she formerly taught in my home institution, SOAS, mm. and wrote books with wonderful titles like Women, Androgynes, and Other Mythical Beasts. Um, and that's always my favourite, of course, of her book, but she's probably known to a new generation through her volumes on Hinduism, which came out lately and not without some controversy, which I think Kushwant Singh would have loved. But I think Kushwant Singh would really like to have met Wendy at the time she wrote this book, because he was always fond of beautiful young women, though I know we shouldn't say <laughs> that these days. And Wendy's remarkable book, um, which is just coming out with Speaking Tiger in Delhi, is called An American Girl in India. Um, letters and recollections of her time there as a student in 1963 to 4. And it's a fascinating document, as Arshia will, of course, be telling us, because, you know, this is about initial impressions of somebody who went on to hold one of the most prestigious positions in South Asian studies, and I can never pronounce this properly, um, Wendy Mercia Eliada, is that near um, um, Professor distinguished service professor at the University of Chicago, now emerita, um, and working on the history of religion. Now this, this book, I think, will be of great interest to many looking back at the historical document as well as Wendy's own personal life. So I'll hand it over to you, Arshia, and I look forward to joining you again for the discussion. Welcome both to a virtual London. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, hello, Wendy. Hello, Arsha. <laughs> Together How are again. You today. Together <laughs> again. Um, you know, uh, Rachel very um, correctly introduced, said that I was your student, but I do want to say that I'm still your student. And I will always be your student. And you will always be my teacher. But having said that, I was want to say um, that you are really one of my dearest friends and um, people know you as a scholar many of us have the great good fortune of personally and um, you know your warmth your generosity your sense of humor your sense of loyalty um, all of that is visible in this book when you were 22 years old and I, I think that that is fantastic that even people who don't you personally get to enjoy um, that, that part of you, you know, the, the person behind all the degrees and the accolades and the big chairs and, you know, uh, and the beautiful Indian shawls and the red lipstick. And, um, so, um, were you prepared for India in any way at 20? It was a big shock to me. When I got there, I was so sheltered. I really haven't been out of the States. I was brought up, upper middle class parents and so on. So when I found these letters, which had been lost for 50 years, I started reading them. I was embarrassed, sometimes shocked by the naivete, by my attitudes toward things like race and gender. It was do so differently now. There were a lot of the letters which I found embarrassing. And when I presented the book to my wonderful publisher, Bobby Singh, I said, I want to cut this, I want to cut this, I'm ashamed of this, we can't publish this, we can't publish this, let's cut this. And he said, No, I'm comfortable, leave it in, but apologize for it. I had a preface saying, When I said X and Y, I was wrong. Or I changed my mind, or that's what we thought then. 
So he made the book into a kind of a dialogue between my young, spoiled brat self that was never seen. I've never seen poor people before. I've never seen the slums. <laughs> I've never seen the slums of New York. And then I'm in Calcutta. So, yeah, ah, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, my yeah. so he said, leave that in, and then explain who you were and how you've changed. How you would say these things. How you understand better what what you saw then. So the book came, came to me kind of a dialogue between my 81-year-old self and my 22-year-old self. And it became also an exercise in something that we're all doing, which is contemplating the stupidity of who we were 50 years ago before we got older, and apologizing for it and trying not to do it anymore. We just race, the gender, change our pronouns, use certain words that can so this book is about that too. It's about who I was then and who I am now, and how I have to apologize for a lot. But at the same time, I loved India. I met wonderful people. I got them. I described them well. They came off the page. You can see that I wasn't an idiot. No, you were not an uh, idiot. You were a young <laughs> 22-year-old girl in the 1960s. You know, you were a creature. Rat. Yes. That may be, but you were very much a creature of your time, you know. Yeah. Um, but when you were reading the letters, uh, did you remember that girl? Or was she just a stranger to you? I remembered her. She had the same sense of humor. The letters are funny. She yeah, makes this, yeah. I kept putting in footnotes explaining all the jokes. That I did. Yeah. I did a lot of yeah, 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 I, yeah. I recognized her. So there are a lot of places where I said, I heard this wonderful story and I tell it. And I tell it wrong. I tell the story of Saranyu and how she turns into the bear. But I got a lot of the details wrong. So I left it in. But then I wrote a whole book about her 10 years yeah. later. So there's a footnote that says, this story is not exactly right, but I got it right yeah. when I published the book and yeah. the title yeah. of the book. So it's like yeah. seeing a bud that's going to turn into a flower someday. And you can see, yeah. the, or you can see the love of India, the passion for Shiva, mm -hmm. the passion for the landscape, the people, loving the people that I met and getting them down, quoting what they said, the characters, and so forth. So, the essence is there, but there's just a lot of mistakes, a lot of naive generalizations. It's, and the other thing yeah. that that I left things out then, because I was writing for my parents. And you don't tell everything to your parents. No, you I don't. don't tell it to my parents. Yeah. So yeah. then I wrote other footnotes in this conversation between the me and the, and the her, where I said, well, for instance, I went to a goat sacrifice. Talk about how the goat and the priest got the goat by the horns and someone else grabbed it by the hind legs and they pulled them and they pulled them and then the scimitar came down and the head sprang away and the blood spurted <laughs> and at that point I said well, at that point I needed a bit of air so when I wrote to my parents I needed a bit of air what I did say was I passed out cold fell on the ground, <laughs> had to be carried out. My friends missed yeah. the whole rest of the ceremony. People had to fan me and give me water to drink and things like that. So in the 81-year-old part of the conversation, I put in the things that I that I censored, kind of parental guidance in reverse, things that I censored parents. So, so that's the dialogue. Yeah. You know, um, I, um, I think the book resonated with me oh, for a hundred reasons. Uh, but one of which, you know, possibly number 89 reason was that I was 22 when I left home. I came to America and I was writing letters to my parents and God knows I was not putting everything in there. <laughs> you know, it really, it really is parental guidance. It is, you know, no, 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 they don't need to know this. You know, they won't know how to handle it. Or like if you're sick or something, it's like, what's the point of telling them? You know, they're 10,000 miles away. They kept can't saying, do anything. I'm in, I'm in wonderful, I kept saying, I'm in wonderful health. I'm in wonderful health. And then I said, now that I've gotten better, since I've yeah. gotten better, I realized I <laughs> yeah. never told them that I was sick in the first yeah. place. So. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I mean, that, honestly, honestly, that is one of the great pleasures of writing to your parents because... You don't say everything. You know, I, I'm sure it's true for parents. It's one of the great pleasures of writing to children. You don't tell them everything. You know, I would come home um, in the summer from America and say, oh, 
this happened or oh, I didn't know, you know, whatever, whatever. <laughs> but, 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 I've always been very curious about how you got to Shanti Niketan because typically you would imagine if a young American scholar and you were already a budding scholar well on your way to, well on your way to being the Wendy Doniger that we all admire, why did you go to Shanti Niketan and not to Calcutta University or, I don't know, um, JNU or something Good like question. that? So when I was at Harvard, so I, I was hardly on my way. I had just, I finished my BA from Radcliffe and I had one year of, my, of an MA. That's all I had. So I was really, really a, still a bud. Um, and my <laughs> professor was Daniel H. H. Eagles, the great Sanskrit, who was a Southern gentleman from West Virginia, who really didn't like people of color, didn't like women, didn't like Jews. So I was a two-time <laughs> loser in his scale of unacceptable people being yeah. a Jew and a woman, but he liked me and he was nice to me. But he was very old-fashioned and he was worried about a young girl alone in India. And so he thought, um, among other things, Shanti Niketan was born of Tagore's University, it's a great university, but at that time, it was also a kind of finishing school for upper class and girls. Exactly. And he thought I would be safe there. I would mm -hmm. be in the Borla hostel with all the other upper class ladies, and we would, you know, talk to each other, and there'd be no boys, and there'd be a trophy bar at the door to protect us. So he <laughs> thought I would be safe. And he was right. It was a very easy entry. It was not a bad thing. Smack at the middle of the street. So I started with a world a little like the world I was used to, after so so. And also I was interested in Angla, and the culture, that was a great place to do it. I met the Tagore family right away, I met people. And then from there, when I got sea legs, kind of, I started branching out and uh, traveled. He was right. He, he may have wrong about some things. But he was right that Shanti Niketan was a lovely place, a gentle place, and a terrible place. And, and was, it, was it really like um, like a 20th century Gurukula? Was it really like that? I mean, did you study under the trees? Did you grow your own food? Did you wash your own clothes? Yes and no. <laughs> we certainly did not. Um, we had servants. We did not wash our own clothes. And a lady came and took my clothes away and basically smashed them on rocks. Yeah. Um, we were supposed to have. <clears throat> we were supposed to have all our classes under the trees, but I arrived in the monsoon. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the first time we said, "Well, class in Bangla, we tried to get to the trees. It was a downpour. No one could. So we all met under the tree and raced back into the buildings looking for a place to hold a class. But everyone else had also raced back into the building because they were supposed to be meeting under the trees too. <laughs> so we spent the whole hour looking for a place to meet. We never had a class. After a couple of days of this, the, the efficient American in the gut, I went to them. I said, look here, why don't we just schedule the classes in the classrooms during the monsoon? They said, no, at Shanti Nikhazen, the classes are held under the trees. And so basically, during the monsoon, I didn't have any classes at all. But afterwards, the classes, when, when it wasn't a monsoon, we met under the trees. We did indeed meet under the trees. And um, how is it making friends? Was it difficult? Um, uh, was oh, your, just so your general extroverted nature just, you know, um, made it simple? What, what, it just I, mean, I don't know yeah. why it was simple, but I right away met some wonderful people. What I found most interesting, you know, I read the letters myself after 15 minutes. It's almost like reading somebody else's letter. The lost for so long. Meeting the characters that I met, I met Mr. Judy Roy, mm. who became friends. And then I met this wonderful Punjabi girl named Chancha, who is in many ways, I think, the heroine of the book a high-spirited, chubby, uh, fast-talking, sort of take-no-nonsense-from-anyone kind of a person who looked after me and took care of me and wrote, told wonderful stories. So she's in some ways the, the heroine. I met her right away. She immediately realized that I was helpless and stupid 
She had to take care of me. She did everything for me. She yelled at my servant, they're not doing this right. She gave the food back to me. And she was, mm. she was great. She had one of her stories. There's, there's some very sad stories from her. She told me about what it was like to be a, a Hindu in Lahore when particularly occurred at the killings. There's some rather dramatic and terrible stories in the letters that she told me. But she was also very funny. Her father was a Sikh, and, and Chamsil said she got into a lot of trouble once because when she was in school, when she was six or seven years old, they were learning English, and the teacher asked her what the word meat meant. And Chamsil said it meant without ice. <laughs> and she got her father into a lot of She told me about her grandmother, who was very high caste, very, very fussy about pollution and she kept the kitchen really clean and to teeth run in from outside and touch as many pots as she could and then run out again and her grandmother then washed all the pots so she's a great character in the letters and Miss Tooney Roy also very a serious a beautiful talented young woman so so I met these people in San Diego and I met people on trains people were just nice to me it was a time I was going from Bhopur, which is where Shanti Niketan is down to Calcutta, and along the way everybody was eating their lunch and I didn't have anything with me. And a man said, aren't you eating your lunch? And I said, well, I had some, but I left them in Shanti Niketan. So when the next stopped, he ran out of the train, bought some food, it wasn't even bananas, and came back in and offered it to me. And he said, because you left your bananas in Shanti Niketan. <laughs> and that was a wonderful, it was a complete stranger. So yeah. I, people, we sang songs on trains, we exchanged poems on trains, um, on buses yeah. too. I was on a bus yeah. once and the bus stopped. No, it was, it was a train. I was on a train and I had to wait for another train. And the train master invited us to his little honey and fed us some food and it was time for the train to leave. And I said, we better go. He said, no, they are. I'm the train master. They have to <laughs> wait for us. He insisted that we have more tea and every train is waiting. And finally we got on and he started the train. And that's when I learned why it is that Indian trains were never on time. Things They're like that. Never on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So things yeah. like that happened. No, I mean, it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, trains um, until fairly recently, this common salary in trains is just amazing you know um and on is singing together sharing food telling stories arranging marriages all kinds of stuff I mean, they become this little microcosm and um yes. train journeys used to be really lots and lots of fun but it's nice that um, they took a foreigner in it wasn't it wasn't indians with yeah, indians yeah, it was an american yeah. girl it was, it was nice they let me into that salary that yeah, was what yeah, yeah 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 so so many memories, Wendy, from that um, short year, because a year. What is your, um, I have my favorite stories of the book. What is your um, standout memory? What, what do you love to remember? What is the memory that gives you um, pleasure? I think there are, there are several. It's hard to choose one. But the, the first thing that comes to mind and that of in the letters. It wasn't even a memory. It's what I was reminded of when I read the letters. What I noticed and cared about was I was carried away by the beauty of the landscape and the climate, by the stars at night, by the rain during the monsoon, walking in the countryside around Shanti Niketan, the way you saw a, a, a row of little boys on the top of a kind of a dike just watching along somebody playing a flute while he was herding cows straight out of a miniature painting of Krishna. It was very mythological to me, the way the landscape came to life and the way the, the architecture of the landscape, the way that the Hindu temples were like just sort of larger mounds than the other ones that we found in the side and the way the way the monsoon started, the way the monsoon ended. So a lot, there's a lot of the sky at night, the amazing sharpness of it, the way people were in the monsoon, the way they didn't even try to stay dry, but just ran around <laughs> wet and then went inside and changed their so, so 
so I was amazed by the climate of the landscape. The other thing which I wrote a lot about, this I do remember vividly, was that I learned a lot about one particular kind of Indian music, which was the Sharod, and in particular the of Ali Akbar Khan, whom I met in Calcutta and was sway with, and um, followed him around he took me to his concerts. He helped me buy a Sharod and he taught me to play it. So I spent a lot of time learning about it. I wrote in the letters a lot about how what I loved about Indian music is that it went bump, 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 the way European music I knew went, but it went the way, the way it slurred between the notes. So I was, I was, it was my first real experience of that kind of Indian music. Um, I was very scornful of Ravi Shankar and the sitar. I also met him. They were, they were, the two played together. But I didn't really like Ravi Shankar. <clears throat> and I love the way he played. So there's a lot about, about that particular kind of music. It's a concert that after the concert is so that was that was near the end of my stay. That was in December. <coughs> so it was after the two. But I loved it. That that's that's very powerful. But, yeah. Yeah. but you know, again, I mean, um seeing that I've known you for um <coughs> just about, well, more than half my life. Um these two things are very much the Wendy that I know, this sort of um very profound or very um, deep connection with nature. You're always looking at the stars and in this case, the ocean and, and how much music is so, in your life. I'll show you where I am. Here, we're talking about nature. So here yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah, show everybody you are. Yeah. yeah. On, the coast of, uh, on the coast of Cape Cod, this is Cape Cod Bay. This is there. That's what I see from my window. As I There's a marsh and beyond the marsh is the sea. So. So this is a happy place for me. I'll say lots of birds. To, I interrupted you. Well, go ahead. No. Go ahead. No. Um, I was wondering, um, since so much of you has stayed the same, um, from the 22-year-old girl to the soon-to-be 82-year-old um, um, woman, um, what what is there something you learned in India, like about, I don't know, um, perhaps Hinduism, perhaps Shiva, perhaps people that still stands you in good stead today? It's really, I think the thing that carried through the years in which I was reading manuscripts and texts and, and not being there was how people looked and moved and dressed. Women in Rajasthan carry big loads on their head, beautiful brass pots, um, the different sorts of ways that people wore their saris, um, the different sort of that that Indian women have from from me, the people I knew. I read about Gaya or Shakuntala or Kunti or uh, I had person in mind. It wasn't just a, a character in a story. I thought of Michelle of Chanchal. I thought of the, the Indian women that I knew. I had a strong sense. I used to see how they put on their sari. They taught me how to put on my sari and so forth. So I had a, a, a strong sense of, of the actual human qualities of the characters that I read about in the stories. I was also appalled by caste and the injustices and the poverty and the, of the people who were not at Shantani Caton uh, going to a finishing school. I saw, I had, I saw aspects of life in India that I'd never seen in America, um, and it moved me very much. Um, the sadness could get used to. Be begged for. So sad, I didn't know what to do at first. I used to give money to beggars and my Indian friends said, don't do it, don't do it, and so forth. 
there was a window in my uh, my, my room, Dante Nikaden, <clears throat> and I would see her. I would hear from the distance. She would say, "Mom, mom, mom," and I'd hear the sound, and I knew that she was coming. And I would give her something, and she would go away. I was really deeply distressed, deeply distressed by the treatment of the Lord, by the suffering of, of her poor people. At first, when I talk about being naive, I talked about seeing people sleeping in the streets in Calcutta, and I, I, I knew it was a fantasy. I had a fantasy that they would wake up and then go home. <laughs> I, I saw them with their children, and I said, well, you know, the children at least are well, even people who have nothing, at least they give what they have to the children. The children are all well fed, and, so, and it wasn't true. Um, and I learned after a while that I was a uh, whistling Dixie, as we, as we say. Uh, so those yeah. things, on the one hand, the, the admiration of the beauty of the women, of the class women, and at the same time the suffering of other people, and all, all during my academic work, I was very, very sensitive to issues of the past. I wasn't a sociologist, I wasn't writing about it, but it comes into all the stories you read in Sanskrit. And I was always, uh, when they talked about a beggar coming to the story, there's always stories about a beggar coming. <clears throat> I had an image, a very sharp image of that thing. Um, so those two extremes, um, the privilege of being among the upper classes in Bengal, which was so lovely, and at the same time, the growing awareness of something I had never noticed in my own country. This haunted me, helped me in my work, brought it alive. Um, those are things I, I carried away with me, and also the landscape. When it said he went out to the jungle, I, I could imagine the jungle. I saw the, I saw the landscape. So. And now um, you're going to have a tree planted in your name in the Sundarbans. How beautiful is that? What a beautiful circle for you to be able to close because the festival is going to do that. So, yeah, yeah. I would love so, listen, that. I, I'm going to use a segue. You said you um, were very, uh, very pleased to, to have Indian friends and, you know, to, to notice the way Indian women walked and how they carry loads on their heads. And, you know, what did you look like, my dear, when you were 22? I think there's a lovely picture on the cover <laughs> of your book, right? So, do you have it at There hand? are very Is few it? pictures. I don't know. I, I lost the letters and the photographs. I found the letters in, 19, in 2018. I never found the photographs. I just have one or two short uh, uh, photographs in which I appear. So, there is a picture on the cover of the book of me with my mother. Um, I don't know. You could, you, can you show it in this program? I don't know whether you have it or not. Yeah, I think you can do sh screen share. Can um, I do screen, screen share? share? I suspect so. Um, you don't have a copy of the book, do you? I don't have a copy of the book, yeah. but I have on my I have on my computer a copy of the cover. Um, so I want. Okay, Wendy. wait. Uh, we, yeah. Yeah, um, we just got a method saying Ashwini will show it to us. So, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So maybe he'll do that and you can tell us also um, what your mother felt um, about coming to India and how she found you in India. Was it the same Wendy, a great oh, neck, or was funny. this another little girl? Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful having, as I said, I, I was very close to my parents and I was homesick for them. Uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Donegars of Great Nick about my mother and my father. And um, I wrote these letters to them. And so uh, when my parents were going to come and visit me in India, that's how close I was. I mean, how many people do you know who have their parents come along on a research trip? So, <clears throat> so my parents my parents were supposed to come at the last minute. My father couldn't come. There was a crisis. He was a publisher, and there was a crisis in his publishing company. And my mother came, and as you would have known from the other book, my mother was an extremely domineering, loud, wonderful personality who sort of took over everything and bossed me around a whole lot. Where in India, she let me boss her around. It was wonderful. 
I was in charge, and she was very well behaved for most for the most part. She mm. was much braver than I was when we went to uh, Banaras of Varanasi. There was a man with a python. He said, "Would you like?" He said to me, "Would you like to hold the python?" I thought, "No, I don't want to hold that damn python." My mother yeah. said, "Yes, please." And one of the photographs yeah. of the book was of my mother cheerfully holding the python. Yeah, and when yeah. we were in um, Madras, um, we went up into the hills to see a wonderful uh, Katakali performance of the Mahabharata. Uh, there's a picture of that in the book, too. And they, it was in a little tiny village, and they offered us food. And I had been sick a lot in India, and I'd, been very, I'd become very... I ate sort of like hard-boiled eggs and bananas was what I was supposed to eat. And they brought us these trays, trays full of things. You couldn't even tell what it was. God knows what it was, you know, snake gizzards or something like that. And they gave it to both of us. And I looked at my mother and I said, and she smiled and she ate it and she ate it and she ate it. And she, it and she didn't even have the good grace to get sick afterwards. It was just fine. Yeah. So, yeah. so she had a lot of fun. She was Good natured about the difficulties, and, and when much later, in 1991, when she was dying, and we were by her bedside. She turned to me and she said, "You know, the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me in my whole life was the trip to visit you in India." She said it was the uh, point so of her life. I was, so I was very moved by that. She and I didn't always get on that well, but we got on really well in India. And then she said that at the end. So that was very, that was I'm really sorry that um, the parents' book, The Donegals of Great Neck, is not going to be published. Yeah, obviously, I mean, it doesn't have the same kind of uh, context. No. But, um, you know, uh, here's the companion book. It really, really is yes. a companion book to your yeah. memoir. Um, so we're going to see the book cover right now, but I want to keep talking. I want to talk to you about one very specific thing. Um, That's funny. Great Let's see the cover, then we'll keep talking. Okay. Yeah. There it is. The cover. There I am. It's in Mahabalipuram. I'm sitting on the Nandi on his little with my hands on his hump. And there's my mother leaning on it behind me. You can see we have the same basic shape of face. We have the same reddish hair. Um, there we are. It's a wonderful cover. Ravi Singh did a wonderful job. It's clever how they put the writing in the only meaningless parts of the photograph. It's really neat. Anyway, so that's one of a, of a few pictures that I still had um, from, from my visit to India. That's who I was and that's who she was. Okay, so what did you want to ask? So here's my great neck question. What did oh. they put in the water? Because there is another <laughs> great woman Sanskrit is from Great Neck, Long Island, yeah? Yeah, Barbara wanna, Stola yeah, Miller. Barbara Stola Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a very, was, she was a professor of Sanskrit at, at Columbia, at Barnard. We were in the same class in Great Neck High School, and yeah. we were not friends. We <laughs> moved in different factions. Um, I was what would have been a hippie, except it was the wrong years for it. What we called it then was a bohemian. I hung out in Bennett's village with artists and gay people, which was very risque in those days, and so forth and so forth. And she wore cashmere sweater sets, you know, the, 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 very neat, neat. And I wore stuff like this even then. I was already, you know, dressing like this. So we didn't get along at all. We only got along years later when we were both grown up lady professors. Um, something about great neck i don't know to prove yeah, at, at one yeah. time she and i were the only was before uh, uh, Roseanne roche came came to america we were the only lady professors of sanskrit in america we were the same graduating class at great neck high school amazing amazing <laughs> really really amazing but let us now talk about um your current work right because you have retired so they tell me i've yet to believe it um, i know that you're not teaching anymore but you're writing as much as ever you're reading as much as ever you're helping your students as much as ever including me you know that i never publish anything without your red pencil <laughs> going through it several times um, yes but there's a big piece of you in my new book too so it's uh oh, well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah it trades so the uh, and Ravi singh is exclusively your publisher in india god bless him for that Ravi Singh um, is just so wonderful. Yeah. Yes. 
So I think it's the great of water with whom we're going to talk to again, who once told me that in India, in some circles, he's known as ravishing, which you get yeah. by putting H and sing a little bit forward and so yeah. forth. But, yeah. um, not yeah. only has so, he been very brave about publishing books of mine that have made some people cross, but he's also been very inventive. He's my editor. He goes through things and he says, why don't you say this? And why don't you change this? And why don't you tell me more about that? And in this last book, of course, he made a tremendous difference. He said, let's have the other half of the conversation. So um, so he's published yeah, uh, he's, almost yeah. all of my books in the last 10, 12 years, except the one which I thought was so localized that only New York Jews would buy it, basically. I didn't think it would go and come up. So, but all the so, others, and the ones I'm doing now yeah. also. Yeah, no, Ravi's a great editor. He edited my Ramana and, you know, I'm forever great. He's a book. wonderful editor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's also a great publisher. Let us say that, or oh, let us name the publishing house since everybody doesn't know who Ravi's singing. Speaking is. Tiger. It's, it's Speaking Tiger. Speaking yeah. Tiger oh, Books. Good. And uh, last year, I believe, you he um, you you published a book yep. on horses, on which horses, is your other great passion in life. Yes. Is it not? It was and, also... One of the privileges of getting old, there are problems involved, but one of the privileges that you can write from the heart. You're not writing to impress. I am a great scholar. Look what I know. Um, you do that when you're little. But when you're yeah. grown up, you say, this is what I've found out about life that matters to me. And you write a different kind of a book. The Donegas of Great Neck was certainly, in a way, an apology to my mother, because as I said, we fought a lot. And the horse book, was put together everything I'd always loved about horses in my private life and how I'd always noticed horses in literature. Even in the horse book, I had just discovered the letters from India when I published the horse book. There's one passage describing a horse painted on the side of a house in the Bengal countryside, which I described in my letters. And I described it very well. I said it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Just a painted on the side of a mud hut that didn't have plumbing or anything, just a very simple house. So even the letters from India began to get into the horse book a little bit <laughs> by having that one horse, but also it's also the horses in the Rig Veda. It's also a scholarly book, you know, horses in the Mahabharata and all of that. And so it's a combination of my personal experience of horses with Alfred Benjamin, who grew up in yeah. India because her father was the commander in chief in India. Um, there's a story there too, of course, a different story. Uh, yeah, and yeah. so it's called Winged Stallions and Wicked Bears, Bears Horses yeah. in Indian Myth and Literature. And uh, that's the last book for this one. That uh, It's not the last book. Ravi then invented a book of dreams, cutting together several yes. pieces about dreams that I'd written in the past, and I added another one, and there's a whole new book, which is really his book as much as my book, about the mythology of getting inside of other people's dreams, getting inside the mind of God. It's a very theological and philosophical book, really, for me. Anyway. And very much rooted in um, the Yoga Vasishta and your book, Dreams, Illusions, and Other Realities. I mean, Rachel was talking about in your introduction how you have the best titles. This is my favorite title of all your books. Dreams, illusions, and other realities, and much of the much of the Ravi Singh um, dreams book, I think, comes comes out of there. But you are still doing massive scholarly work. You have a translation of the Mahabharata, not the Mahabharata, but the last five books of the Mahabharata coming out next month, right? That's right. Um, that's right. Um, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. It's coming. It's it's coming out in America, maybe Oxford next month and it's coming out in India in August, I think. Yes, um, it's called yes. After the War, The Last Books of the Mahabharata. And it's a translation of the last books of the Mahabharata, but it's also an introduction and discussion because again, just as I think the letters book has something to say about our quandary now about our shameful past as, 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 a, as a planet, um, so too um, in the Mahabharata, the last books are the heroes coming to terms with their shameful past. Looking back upon the war and all the terrible things they did, the, the people they killed that they shouldn't have killed, the whole war which shouldn't have happened. And in particular, it's about 
the word money is a wonderful Sanskrit word for which there's no single English equivalent, which means anger, pride, righteous anger, vengeance. How dare you do that to me? Now that you've done that to me, because I am an aristocrat, I will do something to you. All of that is in Mandu. And it's what kept the Mahabharata battle going on for so many years, because they did this to Draupadi, so we'll just do this to you. Because they did the night raid, we'll do this to you, and so forth and so on. And so in the last books, they come to terms with this. They try, They go to heaven, they find their enemies in heaven. And they say, I don't want to be in heaven if he's there. So the battle threatens to go on even in heaven until they realize they, they never should have been fighting with these people in the first place. So it's really an extraordinary book, the, the last has yeah. the last quarter of the Mahabharata. And it's yeah. quite relevant, I think, to uh, other things that we're thinking about today, yeah. Ukraine and other places on the planet and so forth. So that was a lot of fun to rethink. I've been yeah. working on it for years, but I finally put it together in this, in this last year. Yeah, it's it's amazing how the Mahabharata changes after the war. I mean, it becomes like a different genre almost of it writing really and thinking, and um, yeah, it's it's um, meaningful, you know, to to read it as well, as you said in our times. Um, it's, many it's, of it's us. A it, 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 forms things, yeah. a, it forms a piece. I mean, I translate it partly because there are fairly good translations of the first few books of the Mahabharata. Um, they were done um, at Chicago um, some years ago. And there are pretty good translations with the play and pictures of some of the little books, but no one has ever really properly translated the last books. Yeah. The P.C. Roy translation, of course, is always there. Uh, when John Smith did his translation. He did do hardly any of it. He left out most yeah. of the last books. Yeah. So there's a real academic need for an accurate translation. But I think there's also a need for people who didn't know they were interested in the art yeah. to to read about what, what we can learn from this book. So, so that's coming out also, yeah, also from I think, thing. Yep. I think many of us need a moral re-examination and this is a great prompt at a very, very, very difficult time yeah. Um, yeah. in our lives. and. Um, yeah, so I'm going to invite Rachel to join us, Wendy, since she's a friend of both of ours, and she yep. too was once a little girl or a young woman <laughs> writing letters home from India, perhaps. Did you, Rachel? Did you write letters home from India? I did, but perhaps not as often. I was wondering, I mean, um, Wendy was more in one place, whereas I was moving around remembering the old post restaurant and going to see if, you know, you had any letters from home. Yeah. But I mean, I'd grown up with a father who was in the Navy, so I was kind of used to living relationships through letters from a very early age. Um, I just look back and I think, what did my parents think they were doing? You know, I was a teenager and just went off to India on my own with a backpack and hardly any money. Wow. And, so you know, were even younger than I was. Mm, How old I, were you? 19. Were you? 19, wow. Oh, you beat me by But three you years. know, I mean, yeah, I know. I'm all. I've already reached that age. Oh, you know, our time was the golden age, nostalgia, this and that. But there's something about writing those letters because I know I used to sit down every Sunday evening and write three pages, both sides, to my parents, where I would tell them what had happened in the week, kind of, sort of, right? And they did the same thing. And the the sort of um, the leisure with which you wrote letters, you know, and you came back to them. And email has such a such a sort of instant quality to it that I, you know, I think we process our own experiences so differently in email yeah. rather than we do in letters. But Rachel, I'm sure you have questions for Wendy too. I've been doing all the, the um, interlocuting. Would you like to interlocute for a little while? <laughs> I mean, it was so fabulous to hear you. I mean, you know, I'm very worried. You know, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm I'm very British, and you know, if I say something's nice, that means wow, it was amazing and wonderful. <laughs> and you know, you're just saying everything was wonderful, and I mean, you know, it's very, yes. understatement has never been one. Of, understatement has <laughs> never been one of my problems. <laughs> never, so, never, uh, never, never. Yeah. But you know, the I other mean, thing about the letters, the letters that I wrote, they were very long. Some of them are twelve single spaced yeah, pages. Yeah. I meant them as a way of keeping in touch with the two people I love best, but they're also my field notes. 
I, I didn't, I, I, was, I also was traveling, Rachel, and I afraid I was going to lose things. So I wrote out everything and I sent it home so I'd have it safe. So that when I got back, a lot of it is about science fiction texts I was facing. So it, I was also sort of writing to myself in some ways. Yeah, as yeah, well yeah. As with them, so it was like a, not like a diary because I didn't put those into them. Anyway, go ahead, Rachel. No, I mean, and I think that's fascinating, and that idea of you know being. I mean, you know, my parents would have probably been surprised if I'd written anything very personal to them <laughs> at any point. You know, <laughs> I mean, you're what, British. What, what could you do? You were British. You know, one of my sorry. friends went on an American field trip, and I mean, on you know English speaking Union, and she was eight. 18 I think and she was away for a year and she once rang home and her father said are you unwell? And she said no and he said, well, no need to call and put the phone down on her but even no, I, I left things out, the other thing I left out I remember <clears throat> was uh, at Durga Puja um, they gave us a, um, a lovely little milkshake to drink and I had it, it was delicious and I'm, I've always been busy. I said can I have another and everybody laughed and I sort of realized there was a reason. So I had another. And of course, it was hot. It was liquid marijuana. So I be, And I wasn't much of a drinker. I never did drugs. I wasn't that kind of a teenager. I, tell you, I was a sheltered girl. So I got stoned out of my mind. And so my notes on drug abuse are very, very slight. They're the, the shortest part of the book, in a way. Um, and I did not tell my parents about that. That's just what I keep students. But I remembered it vividly. I was with Ed Dimmick from the University of Chicago, and uh, we drove around the night on an open jeep. He was stoned too. Someone else was driving. There was a driver. And as we went around the Maidan, it was dark, it was unlit in those days at least. He thought we were in Chicago and it was Lake Michigan and he wanted to go and swim in it. We had to keep Professor Dimmick from jumping out of the jeep to go swim in it. Those things did not get But I wonder about this you now also. Um, both Rachel and Wendy, that, you know, when we write these letters that are somehow to ourselves, right? Yes. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a really odd combination of mythologizing our lives and telling the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. there's, a, mm -hmm. there's a sort of sense of you're creating a self, yeah, that perhaps yeah. your older, older self will find and read. Or your parents yes. would say, oh, my darling daughter, I'm so proud of you. When actually you're the devil, you know. Uh, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a lovely, um, yeah. it's a lovely tension. It's a really beautiful negotiation. Um, I, I, because I was writing to, but you're absolutely right. And both because I was writing to them and because I was trying to cheer myself up when I was terribly homesick, I pretended to like everything more than I did. And I was ashamed that I wasn't able to like everything in India. I lied to myself. I didn't really mind this. I didn't really mind this. So there's there's that big lie going on through all the letters. I very occasionally say how nice it was to get to a place where I where I had a clean bed. And only then did you know that I'd been sleeping under conditions that had bothered me because of their bad quality and I'd slept well and so forth. So you are trying to create mythologize, brave traveler, everything, I, I, the more obstacles I encounter, the more fun I have and all of that, whereas you're really frightened part of the time and disappointed part of the time and sick part of the time. And it, it, creeps, it creeps into the letters sometimes. In a negative way, I say, I'm not homesick anymore. I say, oh yeah, well, I guess I must have been homesick or something like that. Because you are creating a self for your own self to be proud of later on. That's the person in the India we think. call your good self, Wendy. That is your good your self. Good self. Yeah. You that leave out the thing that, that you're yeah. 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 And I was also well, thinking, you know, it must have been very different. I mean, obviously, you know, going in the 60s and I went in the 80s, you know, different times, of course. But also when you were going with a Brit, you were suddenly facing a whole bit of British history that you'd done a bit of at school but didn't really know. And suddenly it was like, oh, my God, here it is. And, you know, yeah. I wasn't expecting yeah. to see you here or you here. And, you know, yeah. I don't know if it's an American if it felt different. Um. I was grateful at first for the things that the British had done. I was glad that the signs were in English, things like that. 
oh, thank God for that. Now I know where I am and stuff like that. Um, but I'd also seen, even when I was in England, it was interesting, the very first letter is from London before I ever got on the plane to Calcutta. And I had interviewed Jane Wu and her husband, who had um, been the architects of um, Chandigarh, the Kurhuas, the Kurhuas design city. And I asked them, even then, I said, what do you do when you get sick in India? It's interesting that even then I was worried that I was going to get sick, as indeed I did. And Jane Wu said, well, we go to England. And I said, well, <laughs> what do the Indians do when they get sick and in England? And she said, they go to England. So there I am with this colonial bullshit in my head, and I get on the plane and I land in, in India. So I was aware of the British and Tagore had a lot to do with the world. So I was in a borderline, borderland in a way in, in the beginning, and I got deeper and deeper into India itself as I, as I moved on. Um, but I did go as an American rather than as an English woman, and it made a, a big difference. The horse book that Arsha referred to, which has a lot in it about Penelope Betjeman, much later, well, not that much later, actually, in 1965, two years after I got back from um, India, I moved to England for 10 years, and I spent those 10 years riding horses with Penelope Betjeman. And that's when I really got to know British India. Um, and she told me what it was like growing up in government house and so forth. So I was not aware of Indian history. I've never been to the story. I always liked to read the texts. So I wasn't really that much aware of Indian of the English part of Indian history when I got there. And I gradually discovered it more and more. And I learned about partition largely from Chanchal and hearing um, her horror stories of what it was like to be during the, the terrible violence of it. So I began to learn uh, history when I got there. Um, and it was an important lesson. But it was well, ancient India that, I mean, I, I mean, I didn't really realise till I looked at the book about, you know, that you'd done Bengali and I, I had no idea actually. And because I always think of you as being very much, you know, interested in ancient India and the Sanskrit. Well, world. well, when I went there, as I said, until I went to that goat sacrifice, I had thought that I actually might um, be um, an anthropologist. I wasn't sure that I was only going to do Sanskrit and I wanted to learn Bangla because I liked what I knew of Bengali literature. <clears throat> and I stayed with Ed Dimmock, who was the great scholar of Bangla um, in America. In fact, one of, my, one of the best stories in the book, I love this story, it's about Ed Dimmock. <clears throat> so he had five children, and he took them with him when he went, and a wife, and he took them all with him when he went to India. So they had this long flight. In those days, it took a long time to get from Chicago, which is where it was, to stop in London, and in Beirut, and all these other damn places. Finally, he arrived in Calcutta at Swinhoe Street, Valley Gardens, in the middle of the night. The five children had vomited on themselves and peed on themselves and pooped on themselves and were exhausted and were crying in the middle of the night, and the, and the house was locked. So he rang and shouted and banged, and finally the Chokidar got out of bed and came and started opening the house, and Ed was so furious, he yelled at the Chokidar in Bangla, he told them what he thought of him and his mother and his sister and his relationship to his sister and went on and on and on with this fluent Bengali curses. Finally, he ran out of breath and he was immediately sorry because he knew it wasn't the Chokidar's fault. And anyway, he was a very nice man at the, and he was a Unitarian minister. So before he could apologize, he was getting ready to apologize, the Chokidar said, Shai, mahalo Banglo Basa Bolkipati. <laughs> Sir, how well you speak Bangla. <laughs> okay, and that I'm going to have to end to... this now. Yeah, I'm going to have to end this now. We have literally a minute, but how appropriate, Rachel, that you should be with us this evening. And how very, very appropriate that we end with a Wendy story because she's she one of the great storytellers of the world. And God knows she has a story for every occasion. So, um, yeah. in Bangla, India, or was, now, the, in, India was the greatest story of them all. India was the great story. So well, thank you thank both you. very, very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Arsha. Thank you, Krishwan Singh.
Did you ever meet him, Wendy? I never did. I never did. But I know of him through Arthur. Actually. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Who I? I mean, I knew when I was a little girl, and one of the things I loved best about him is he never treated me like a little girl. He spoke to me as if I was an adult. I was eleven, and that's, I sort of got used good, to that. Yeah. 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 That's a good yeah. Name. Excellent. So we look forward to the book's publication shortly from Speaking Tiger. Wonderful. Thank, thank, you both. Well, thank you both and thank you. Hello and welcome to a very special se session in the Kushwant Singh Literary Festival. Perhaps today I really need to say hello, namaste, satsriya kaal and salam alaikum because we're bringing together people from around the world who are brought together by the love of poetry, especially poetry in Urdu, a language that is shared between India and Pakistan a language which has one of the great literary traditions. And today we're talking about perhaps its leading light, Ghalib, um, the great poet who we all know as the poet of Delhi. Um, today, I think it's, it's something rather special in Kushwant Singh's, um, as we remember Kushwant Singh, because not only, of course, did he love Urdu poetry very much, but also because we are crossing borders. And this is a theme of today's, um, today's session. We are looking at two people who have worked across um, India, Pakistan, and we also have an American connection too. So let me introduce today's speakers. Um, Raza Mir, who is introducing the, the session today, grew up in Hyderabad, India, um, and teaches in the USA. I believe he's in New Jersey right now, but he writes books on Urdu poetry. Um, he's written The Taste of Words, an introduction to Urdu poetry, and this co-author of Anthems of Resistance. Um, and he's also written a novel, which I've bought for a friend, though not yet read myself, called Murder at the Mushaira. And we hope there won't be a murder this afternoon as we discuss this topic. He is going to be talking to Anjum Altaf, who is based in Lahore, where he um, is, was Professor of Economics and Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at, I see it called Lahore University of Management Sciences, but more familiar to us all, of course, as LUMS Lahore. Um, so wonderful to have this here. He is co-author of Thinking with Ghalib um, and his co-author is in India in a place that Kushwant Singh himself would have loved in the Kumau Hills um, and he's Amit Basole. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. I, I don't know the name Basole but Amit is easy um, for me um, who heads the Centre for Sustainable Employment at the Azim Prangi University, working on what is called jobless growth in India. And he's also Associate Professor of Economics in the School of Arts and Sciences at the university. Uh, Amit is a double doctor, I gather, with a PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts, as well from a PhD in neuroscience from Duke University. So we're coming together with people who are not only geographically differently located, but discipline in different disciplines. But whatever the disciplines they work in, what really brings them together is love of this great poet of Delhi, poet of the world. We're looking forward to hearing from you all. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that extremely generous and uh, uh, should I say, evocative uh, introduction. 
I am really excited to be speaking to Amit and Anjum. Uh, I uh, came across uh, their book project uh, well before uh, it, uh, it was published, and I have been extremely, extremely fascinated by it. So without further ado, I want to lead off by asking first Anjum and then Amit that uh, would you just briefly tell us a little bit about how you connect your own personal self to Ghalib and how this particular book, this collaboration came about? So Anjum first. Uh, sure, uh, Raza. Um, that's that's uh, fairly easy. Um, you know, um, as has been mentioned, Khushwant Singh uh, loved Ghalib. And I think uh, that must have been so because they shared uh, so many traits, you know, like being irreverent, contrarian, uh, challenging orthodoxy, um, inciting people to think for themselves, especially about faith and belief and doing everything in a very playful and humorous way. So um, I think anybody who is um, fascinated by thinking uh, connects with Ghalib very easily. Uh, and um, uh, myself and uh, Amit also, because you know we are economists, um, we want our students to be thinking about all the time about what they're working on, what they're researching. Um, so uh, this really, for me, didn't start as a project that had anything really to do with literary analysis or Ghalib studies or anything of that sort. It was uh, an initiative to get people to think. And for that, uh, you know, like as in, in, in uh, as economists, we found Ghalib to be the optimal resource for doing that. Um, and uh, uh, so we were using Ghalib to do the kinds of things that Khushwant Singh does in his book, you know, get people to think about faith and belief. So uh, that's how it, it, it started for me and both um, independently of each other, Amit and I were you know, kind of exploring Ghalib from different angles. And thanks to the internet, we got together. Um, and from that shared interest, um, you know, this emerged, which ultimately turned into a book. Thank you, Anjum. And Amit, would you add a little bit to this narrative? Uh, yeah. Sure. So thank you. Thank you very much, Raza. It's a pleasure to be talking with you in particular about this book. Uh, and really appreciate the support that you've given from the beginning. Um, so uh, just a little bit about the personal journey first. I think I first encountered Ghalib uh, when I was maybe in my early 20s. I was doing my master's. And um, uh, in my laboratory at the time, there was a senior of mine from Kashmir. Uh, who was a big fan of Ghalib and he introduced me to Ghalib at the time and uh, you know I started reading a little bit and uh, I think as with most people it, it immediately resonated at a very personal level. At the time I was not thinking about a lot of the stuff that made its way into the book which is a very different thing that we will talk about but just at a level of the kind of the, the issues that he was talking about and the way he was talking about it really spoke to me at that time. And then uh, a few years later, I chanced on Francis Pritchett's wonderful website that I think many of our viewers may also know, Desert Full of Roses, uh, which really uh, you know, offers excellent commentary on all of Ghalib's uh, Urdu verses. Uh, 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 yeah, so, uh, you know, and then uh, as it turned, as Anjum mentioned, he and I were, uh, at that time, blogs were new, the, the, the new thing in 2007, 8, around that time. So both of us were blogging about Ghalib in different ways and, and we encountered each other actually, as it turns out, on the Columbia University uh, Urdu list, which is also run by Francis Pritchett. And we found each other there, uh, you know, just uh, by chance. Uh, and then we started this sort of online collaboration. Uh, we, we still haven't met ever in person. Uh, 
so <laughs> the borders being what they are um uh, that that just still hasn't happened but yeah anyway so yeah no it's really so it's wonderful to acknowledge uh, uh the role played by francis pritchett in bringing this book about that is wonderful and you know hui muddat ke ghalib mar gaya par yaad aata hai wo har ek baat par kehna ki yun hota to kya hota to sahi baat hai ke you know ghalib really connects us uh, in multiple ways what i personally found fascinating about ghalib is first of all ghalib had a long life and a long career and in that life and career we are fortunate uh, to have encountered uh, what i may call refer to as a witness to history ghalib was born in uh, mogal india and uh, by the time he died mogal india had turned into colonial india and the cataclysmic events of the 1857 ghadar uh, you know he was a uh, witness to and so i think that uh, through his personality we can really chart out history too and the other thing is that you know it it bears mentioning that he is the greatest urdu stalwart and so the turns of phrase that he created a very philosophically minded person uh, have become standard tropes uh, uh, in urdu language so uh, to that extent i think you did a wonderful job uh, of putting it together uh, could you just talk to me about uh, how you chose the particular structure of that book which is a very unique way to deal with ghalib yeah so you know from the beginning i think the idea was to uh, just stick with a share uh, and and not, and not take the ghazal approach uh, uh, you know uh, and just sort of talk about those two lines and what they bring to mind because a lot of what we in daily life do with ghalib as you you are also familiar is it's those two lines that come you know we, we hardly ever recite a ghazal as you just did you recited a share uh, which just happens to capture whatever is being discussed at the time so we wanted to stay with that mood and say ki is baat pe ye yaad aaya ki uh, if anjum were here i think one of his favorite one is uh, you know every time he hears some politicians in pakistan or for that matter in india say something you know the words that come to mind are khushi se marna jaate jo aitbar hota hai you know so uh, there are these sort of appropriate things that come to mind so we thought uh, we'll stick with that and say okay we'll just talk about this couplet uh, and what brings to mind uh, what comes to mind when you see this couplet the thing that is different uh, is that we are not really doing a lot of as anjum said you know literary interpretation we, we have a translation uh, which is mostly either taken from pritchett or modified a little bit and then most of the entry so to speak for a for a particular share is just us broadening its applicability to the social universe and of course i think many people might not like that i think there's you know there's strong opinions on uh, how much to read into this kind of poetry and i'm sure there'll be people who say well you you shouldn't use this verse to you know talk about this thing or whatever so we've thrown that caution to the wind and it helps that neither of us is coming from the world of literary analysis or galap studies or anything like that so um uh, so you know we took we took liberties with it and i guess some people may like it and some might not sure sure and uh, i think that what you just mentioned uh, speaks very much to the structure of the ghazal so uh, if i may uh, just take a minute to talk about for example the particular ghazal that you khushi se marna jaate wali the ghazal is a very unique uh, i mean in the larger poetic context a very unique form of poetry where the couplets in and of themselves are required to have a thematic coherence but the ghazal itself does not uh, uh, require that so for uh, one of ghalib's most celebrated ghazals is the one that uh, amit mentioned uh, and if we may just look at it together ke ye na thi hamari qismat के विशाल यार होता अगर और जीते रहते यही इंतजार होता दिस इज दतला द फर्स्ट टू लाइन्स राइम एंड नाउ यू नो वेरी क्लियरली ही हैज आर्टिकुलेटेड ए पोजिशन इट वॉज नॉट माई फेट 
to have a union with my beloved. And now that I am at my deathbed, perhaps, uh, had I lived more, it would be the same, uh, you know, waiting. So the, the share moves on. Uh, the one that uh, Amit partially quoted, ke tere vaade par jiye hum. Look at the beauty of this share. Tere vaade par jiye hum, to ye jaan jhoot jana. Jaan is no. That I lived uh, despite your promise. Understand it to be untrue. And, you know, the first line of the puzzle sets up a mystery, which then, of course, the second line solves. Tere vaade par jiye hum, to ye jaan jhoot jana, ke khushi se marna jate agar aitbar hota. That had I really trusted you, I would have died of happiness. So, yeah, the, the dripping irony of this uh, share is such. And so each share in and of itself produces a world. It would have been okay to die, but I die every day. I mean, the, the, the sheer pathos, the poignancy uh, is there. And now the irony is left behind. The irony of the earlier share is left behind. And then, of course, as everybody knows, but it bears repeating, the makta of the ghazal is one where the poet signs his name with a flourish. And in this case, Ghalib is not, Ghalib is a person who is not above, uh, should I say, praising himself uh, and also in some ways putting himself down. And both of them come out in the makta of this uh, ghazal, which says, uh, tasabuf, tera bayan Look at these matters, these metaphysical matters. Tasawuf is really from the word Sufi, but metaphysical, you speak so metaphysically, you speak so philosophically, and you speak so eloquently. Yatira bayan ghalib, tujhe hum wali samajhte. We would have thought of you a saint. And then he puts himself down. Tujhe hum wali samajhte, jo na baada khaar hota. Had you not been a drinker. So ghalib as a uh, we have once often mentioned was really not only uh, uh, proud of the fact that he drank and in this way he connects to Kushwan Sahib a lot because Kushwan Sahib uh, uh, loved his uh, drink. He didn't drink a lot but he always mentioned his whiskey all the time. So we connected Look, all you people when you see my metaphysics don't think of me as this sort of saintly creature. I really love the, uh, should I say, the pleasures that this world gives me. So I find that extraordinary. And I think that your choice of using one couplet uh, and then expanding upon it uh, really, really works. So to get back to the book then, Amit, how did you, uh, you met this person, Anjum, uh, on the list? And at some point in time, I guess you took your conversations offline. How did this book eventually take shape? Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's well, we never really went offline. You know, it's, it's always been online in different forms. Um, so it the, we did a series of blog posts together uh, about 12, 12, 13 years ago. In fact, longer now, almost 14 years ago. And then uh, that was it, really. We selected these couplets. There were about 30 couplets that we blogged about. We talked about them all online, email and so forth. Uh, and uh, it was many years later, and, and then we did our own things. Uh, you know, I moved back to India, I started work at Azim Premji. Anjum was in Lahore for a bit, he went to Habib University in Karachi for a bit, came back to Lahore, retired, you know, all of these things happened. Uh, and then during the pandemic, out of nowhere, I, I got an email from him saying, you know, there's a lot of time now, <laughs> all of us are sitting here, uh, you know, during lockdowns, uh, should we do something about these things that we've written and you know we've talked about having a book but we never did it so i said sure and that was the first time that you know we seriously discussed the book and he managed to get around find a publisher in lahore get got it in manuscript form i spoke to him for the first time only during the pandemic i had never heard his voice you know in all of these years that we we had known each other we had not spoken to each other we did a video call i saw him face to face so to speak only only a couple of years ago so the pandemic has really been largely responsible for bringing the book about and connecting us you know much more closely than than we were before 
uh, as it turns out, I actually visited Lahore once with great difficulty uh, for for four or five days. But I didn't meet him at the time, and he's been to Bangalore, but you know we have never met. Um, so the book uh, it, during the pandemic, it just so happened that there was enough time to make it into one and look for publishers and, and so forth. Great, great. And uh, in terms of you know thirty couplets from a vast corpus of work. uh gives you a lot of latitude to choose uh is there a particular criterion you used for the choice or uh you know did it, did you sample it in particular ways right uh, anjum sir we just uh, he's come back uh, raja sir was just asked about the selection of the couplets uh so since i i have been holding the conversation maybe you would like to come in and talk yeah, a little bit about the choice of couplets and why thank we you. chose the ones that are there yeah thank you amit i just wanted to add to that that you know it's really uh, what we mentioned was that uh, the the decision to go the couplet route rather than the ghazal route really worked out very well for you uh so in this context because the work is very big uh, how did you end up choosing your 30 ashar sure um i think for the for the first part uh, we made a very conscious decision to go with the couplet rather than with the ghazal because uh, you know we were interested in uh, <clears throat> the meaning and because uh, as you know every couplet in a ghazal means something so thematic connectivity in that sense so that was not the good unit of analysis for us uh there a lot more sense and what we were trying to do to invite th- thinking we um, selected the uh, couplets that, that we thought were uh the most meaning intense uh so that that were layered and complex and spoke to the so for us that was i think one of the primary uh, criteria that uh, it would be you know very meaning intensive uh, and uh Amit can more to that because most of them were his selection, and it, I don't think that you know we were thinking very consciously at that time that they would end up in a collection. Uh, it happened to work out that way. That it turned out in hindsight to be a good selection. Ji bilkul, ji bilkul. I think that. Uh, uh since amit you chose maybe you could just say a little more and then you know we will so, we'll spend some time quoting a little bit of lalit yeah 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 so i think you know as anjum said a lot of it was you know driven by this uh, desire to think with with lalit and so i at least was often looking for verses that were off the beaten track too right so i, I remember sort of consciously going through the divan and saying okay what haven't i seen before you know people sing certain ghazals people quote certain ghazals but there are so many more as you said raza it's a large large collection <clears throat> and then once in a while you know a verse just jumps out at you and and the favorite one of mine for this purpose it's not a general favorite verse but just for how it jumps out at you is actually in the book towards the end uh, and that is wafadari basharte us tumhari asli iman hai mare but khane mein to kaabe mein gaado brahman ko i had to read it many times to make sure i was actually reading what i thought i was reading uh, you know because i'd never heard this verse before and and the, it was such a strong image and first of all you know uh, the just seeing alib use the word brahman uh, was new for me because uh, we we don't hear about these verses so often uh, so what is he talking about why is this brahman dying in the temple and why is he being buried in the you know bare mare putkane mein to kaabe mein gaado brahman ko that really grabs you by the throat you know um uh, so uh, some of these couplets i think they really invite you to uh, you know wrestle with what he is saying and he's deliberately 
twisting the or you know up up ending the symbolism is doing all of this sort of you know what in the kabir context you might call ulat bani you know kabe mein ja bajayenge na ko sab to bandha hai dair mein haram so just mashing things up and mixing them up and so forth uh, so uh, part of these verses are really like that you know where you you want to choose a verse to make a particular point uh, and the very first verse with the book which the book opens with um kya farz hai ki sabko mile ek sa jawab again it's a conscious choice to say okay how do we bring in the reader to think about things you know and what better way to start than to quote rather than saying you know let us ask these questions it's not necessary that all of us will get the same answers right so very each nice. one has its own discovery yeah very nice and uh, i think that uh, we could spend i mean there are various themes that emerge from what you said for example the trope of the brahman uh, is used uh, very well by ghalib uh, and is used uh, if i may say so very lovingly right uh, for example uh, in another place he says uh, ke uh, dekhiye paate hain ushah buton se kya faiz ek brahman ne kaha hai ki ye saal acha hai So the Brahman here functions as a soothsayer. Uh, you know, I like to 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 use this as a New Year's greeting to my friends. Uh, let us see what uh, uh, what the lovers what lovers get from idols. Lovers on one side, idols on another side. Now, I don't want to interpret this, and you people, uh, both of you, uh, have done an excellent job of leaving. uh interpretive latitude to your readers in the speech but the brahman comes here almost as a uh as a guarantor as a guarantor that something in the future will work very well in another place galib says uh nahi hai subho zunnar ke phande mein gir aayi wafadari mein shaykh o brahman ki azmaish subha is the you know uh is the tasbih the rosary beads that uh, the muslims use in their prayer and zunnar is the thread that the uh, brahman wears so both of them are markers of faith and he says neither of them really have uh, any con- you know hold uh, what really has hold perhaps is this business of wafadari being staying constant and wafadari mein shaykh aur barhaman ki azmaish hai they are both going to be tested and this connects so beautifully with the verse that uh, uh, you mentioned ke wafadari basharat e ustwari ustwari means constancy right you it's not enough to have faith but when things go bad it is then that you have to uh, be strong wafadari basharat e ustwari asl eema hai eema ka asl hai and the proof of that is that if, if the brahman stays true to his faith then even by the standards of the kaaba he has passed the test very very beautifully done and very uh, excellent uh, suggestion and anjum perhaps you could talk about another such share that you incorporated in your book which spoke to you if you wish uh, <clears throat> uh Uh, and as are all these uh, three mission they are all in the book um but like you we were also uh, very um, taken with them and and uh, uh, with the message that they were uh, conveying especially in the time in which we are uh, living to you know they are they are very very relevant um i like the the couplets uh, that are at the beginning of the book because they induce the reader new to alib to this legitimizing this whole process of uh and also uh, having a particular attitude critical attitude to uh authority you know that you you don't, don't just because somebody is is a 
uh, certain some subject you don't take everything that he or she says for granted. So um, the first couplet already uh, Amit has uh, uh, mentioned. Kya farz hai ke sabko mile ek sa jawab? Aao na hum bhi sair karein koi tour ki. You know the way this to a whole tradition and jolts up the the reader because it hits very close to to something that they are familiar with in their own culture. I mean, uh, you know, we've used something from from other places like Milton, but it doesn't connect in that same way. So, in that spirit, you know, I think that the second couplet. Uh, also appeals to me a lot where Alip says lazim nahi ke khizr ki hum pere ana ke ek buzurg hume hum safa mile right so uh, which we have explored to say that okay even ghalib is a you know a traveler for us so, you know we, we we hear what he says but it's not you know we follow somebody says blindly and a very, very powerful message uh, uh, as far as critical you know, just questioning questioning everything uh, thinking about it on one's own so uh, those two are I like very much uh, and at this stage for what follows on, on the various themes on the theme that uh, was uh, important to Ghalib and also to Khushwan Singh, which you read his book, it comes back again and again to faith and belief and, and religion. So those are the ones that we end with. And we structured the book in the, the first few couplets are, are quite easy to, to read and to understand and to uh, become familiar with. And they increase in complexity as we go towards the end. And, Towards the end, the last one, I think, is is the most most, most complex, and uh, Amit likes it. I like him to to read uh, number thirty. Mm. Uh, but uh, this, yeah, before that, Raza, were you saying something? I thought, uh, or, or oh I no, can... no, I will connect it. I, I, I just okay. Let me just say one thing that uh, both of them, uh, the the points that uh, uh, Anju mentioned kya farz hai ke sab ko mile ek sa jawab aao ke aaj sair kare kohe tur ki it really connects to the uh, the the that uh, Prophet Moses made to the uh, Mount Sinai to the point of Mount Sinai and where he is uh, we, uh, where he is believed to have actually communicated with God and got back to the line, which uh, is the same commandment and church. So I think that uh, Ghalib's each share, if you go and kind of plumb it for meaning, then what you do is you end up connecting to a whole tradition. The other one that uh, Anju mentioned uh, talks about Khizr. Khizr is a uh, is known to be somebody who shows the way to people and also somebody who has had a long life. All that simply connects so beautifully. If you know it, that's great. So uh, if you don't know it, the share still makes sense to you. So I think this is the beauty of uh, Ghalib in any poet. That, you know, you understand it at one layer and then you understand it at the second layer. And if you have the guts, then go down and find the third layer as well. Uh, so wonderful. Amit, please go ahead and talk about the share number 13. Uh, yeah, sure. So that's what we end with. And uh, as Anjum said, this has a lot of terminology in it, like the preceding few also. This is the one, Hum muhid hai, humara kesh hai tar ke rusum, millate jab mit gai, ajzai iman ho gai. I think that is the one Anjum was referring to. That is the last one. Uh, so, hum muhid hai, we are monists, and humara kesh hai tar ke rusum. So, uh, uh, you know, what is what is religion for us? It is the it is the it is the renunciation of all of these customs, uh, and uh, when when these different uh, millets these communities uh, uh, disappear, they become part of this sort of true faith. Uh, and again, it's a verse that 
you know you can interpret in a very conventional way of course which is always possible uh, you know you can say we're well, talking about islam it's talking about uh, uh, communities accepting the faith and so forth but then it also opens many other possibilities of readings you know what what are these communities what is this true faith maybe we are talking about you know people dissolving their differences and becoming human <laughs> you know the the ultimate sort of uh, faith uh, so he leaves all of those possibilities uh, you know open to us which is what is really wonderful about uh, about him um and uh, uh, i just wanted to pick up on one small thing that you mentioned at the beginning as a on the on the 1857 and the other and so forth and uh, this is just in case the viewers are not aware uh, that you know uh, 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 zia muhiddin the the fantastic pakistani actor uh, who has uh, done a lot of readings and recitations has a wonderful collection of ghalib's letters that he has read many of which are also about 1857 too uh, and you know i think uh, seeing uh, you know reading those or or listening to zia muhiddin recite them it also gives you a very good insight into how uh, you know why ghalib was writing about all of this the way he was right and and the change just that he was saying you mentioned that he's born you know he's born when in fact the the british are not even in delhi right this is before uh, the british take over of delhi and then he dies after 1857 so it's a profoundly it's a period of profound change and you can see that he's commenting all those changes and there are some very very nice little little things i love in those letters like he's talking about the new postal system Right, and uh, in saying, well, what, what's this, what's this new system that has come? You know, I'm trying to understand it, uh, and it gives you a very good sense of the context in which uh, uh, he's living. You know, and and he's communicating with all of these people. The changes that he's seeing. The, he goes to Calcutta for the first time. He sees what the British have done, and I think all of that kind of comes into his poetry uh, uh, and makes him extremely modern. Like we say in the introduction, he's he's a very very modern poet. uh in in his concerns and in the way he approaches them and and all of that so just wanted to make that connection yes uh, and it is very important to understand one thing that after the 1857 revolt happened the british responded with a level of violence uh that was you know terrifying and if somebody had to live there and ply their trade uh in that matter they had to be very very circumspect uh galib has written some ashar on the ghadar but uh kahi chhape nahi wo they were put in his uh khutut uh just to go back to one point that amit said the modernity of galib is very uh, apparent in the letters that he wrote he is perhaps the first person to have carried out a uh long series of uh, correspondences with a variety of his peers and in his lifetime his khutut were collected and published and so uh, it perhaps is one of the first instances of this form of prose poetry uh, prose uh, uh, non fiction in urdu and uh, in one of his letters to his friend hargopal tafta he says uh, he quotes a share jiske char uh, misre mein sunata hu ke चौक जिसको कहें वो मख्तल है घर बना है नमूना जिंदा का इस तरह के विशाल से गालिब क्या मिटे दिल से दाग हिजरा का यू नो दैट व्हाट वी यूज्ड टू कॉल द मार्केट प्लेस राइट नाउ इन बैटल फील्ड एंड देयरफॉर वी आर कंफाइंड टू आवर हाउसेस एंड द हाउस हैज इटसेल्फ बिकम अ डंजन ऑफ सॉर्ट्स एंड नाउ व्हाट वी थॉट ऑफ एज द मीटिंग एज द यूनियन ऑफ लवर्स has become a poignant separation and uh, uh, so galib actually is one of the historians of 1857 his uh, book called the stambu uh, which really uh, encounters the rebellion uh, uh, which recounts the rebellion uh, written in persian perhaps to evade uh, certain censorship and uh, you can see uh, some of the encounters of 1857 in there so that is a extremely uh, uh, you know wonderful uh, thing but to go back to the share that you uh, quoted hum muwahid hai hamara cash hai tak ke rusoo you know this business of uh, at that point in time perhaps there were tremendous contestations within muslims 
uh, about different kinds of Muslim sects. But because Ghalib went all the way to Banaras and then to Lucknow and then to uh, all the way to Calcutta, in Banaras, of course, he encountered a lot of, uh, you know, Hindu thought. Uh, he wrote a very famous uh, Persian uh, Masnavi called charag e dair in which he describes uh, Banaras as such, ke ibadat khanae nakhusi anast, uh, hamana kabe hindustanast, meaning it is the it is the worshipping ground of, uh, you know, conscious, the ones that you used to blow. And it is the Kaaba of India. So you can see that he has a tremendous, uh, should I say, uh, affection for this. And then he goes to uh, Lucknow, where, of course, the Shias, particularly Anis and Dabir, are plying their trade. And he develops a tremendous uh, love for Imam Ali and Imam Hussain. And so he brings in the here Shia Sunni element and all the way to Calcutta. Calcutta, you remember, is a churning in the 19th century where the Brahmo Samaj is coming out. And there the interaction is really between traditional Hinduism and uh, uh, the modernity represented by, uh, you know, the Christians and the Britishers. So uh, in some sense, he's imbibing, he's osmotically, uh, you know, getting all this. And then he... Uh, includes it in his shayari so that hum wahid hai hamara cash hai tarke rasoom but the second line is really the hard hitting one isn't it millate jab mit gai ajzai ima ho gai if you break these boundaries between uh, faith groups only then you will really find the uh, true faith so wonderful and uh, anjum maybe uh, talk a little bit more about the book and maybe one of your uh, favorite poems, uh, favorite uh, couplets. One. Sure. Um, Raza, I just read that about the letters. Uh, Ghalib has also uh, talked about the epidemic uh, in, in the those letters. See, in, in one, I think it's July 1861 to Bedi Majru, uh, in which there is a, there is a share, Ho chuki ghalib balaye sab tamam ek marge nagahani aur hai. And he, there he describes the the episode, given that you know we are in the time of the pandemic i uh, gives you a sense that this is not the first time that people are living and and in in the istanbul itself mentioned there is a lot of discussion you know people dying uh, uh, the, the, these uh, i think it was a thing that so um, yes and uh, sure um, you there are some, um, uh, some uh, couplets uh, that uh, are lighthearted and, and uh, you know making big points in a very playful manner. Uh, and then the next one that that I like even more is "Kam nahi jalwa gari mein kuche se bahisht." So, uh, you know, it, to me, you know, uh, Ghalib across as a, as a philosopher in the garb of a poet. And, and these are really making a very big major point uh, that you can very with, with listeners. I mean, you can, one can read, you know, very complex philosophy philosophy, um, but you really need to have a PhD to understand those concepts. But with Ghalib, in 10 words, he can over you. you know, that's the fascinating part about Ghalib. Indeed, indeed. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the the Makta of uh, the Ghazal that said, Ke ho chuki Ghalib balaye sab tamam, ek marge nagahani aur hai. Uh, you know, 
I, I never really connected it to the uh, epidemic, but now that you mention it, again, you know, it goes back to the points that uh, Amit was making that the, uh, and uh, Anjum as well. That it's just, uh, uh, should I say, a poetic and wordsmithing uh, constraint that is placed by the poet on themselves. Otherwise, the ashar are free to discuss different things. So, for example, in the same ghazal that uh, Anjum quoted, uh, uh, the, the matla goes ke koi din gar zindagani aur hai. Although I have a little more to live, apne jine, ji mein humne thani aur hai. I have uh, other plans for myself. And uh, I particularly like one of the uh, more playful ashar uh, 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 of that ghazal that go, uh, so you are sending a message and the, imagine somebody is giving you the missive and you've got it, you're reading it, but the person who sent the missive is waiting. That there is a further addendum. So sometimes, you know, things you express uh, in uh, words. Uh, so uh, that is uh, that is really beautifully done, and you know, then immediately very reflective. So it just shows how much a ghazal goes up and down. You know, when I uh, used to listen to Hindustani music, that I realized that that's what it is. You know, a rag places certain constraints on the musician. But un constraints ke un, under jo ye log in karwaat karte hain, no, that is the uh, you know true mark of a musician. And uh, uh, you know, since we talked about sending letters, dekhe khat mu dekta hai naam abar. I wanted to also mention another one ke, magar likhwaye koi unko khat to ham se likhwaye. Hui sub aur ghar pe ghar se kaan par rakkar kalam nikle. See, this is, this is a very funny one that, you know, my lover uh, has many suitors and they all want to write letters. If they want to write letters to my lover, although they are my rivals, I'm happy to write letters for them because in the process, I actualize my love. So, uh, I'm ready. So, I think that... Uh, it is uh, a beautiful way in which uh, Ghalib constantly talks about writing, uh, you know, letters to the beloved. So, uh, we know the truth of the truth. What is the truth of the truth? That there is no heaven, there is no hell. Perhaps this is what Ghalib is saying. We know the truth of the truth. It's no big deal. And then you... Put a fulcrum there called Lakin. Hamko malum hai jannat ki haqiqat Lakin. What does it do? The mystery is created and the second line solves it. Dil ke khush rakhne ko ghalib ye khayal achcha hai. It does its job. It does its job. This idea of heaven and hell that it keeps you at least placated. And so that's a very beautiful way in which he puts it forward. Uh, some more uh, uh, Anjum. Anything else that really comes to your mind? Um, uh, Raza, I, I want to um, say a few more things about about the the book. Uh, how it uh, uh, obviously the connection of Ghalib with Khushwan Singh is very obvious and very strong. So I, I'm I'm glad we talked about that a lot. But at least two other passions of uh, uh, saying that uh, the book uh, resonated. Uh, you know, the first is, is his um, the importance that he places on friendship. You know, the friendship that rises beyond the constraints of caste and creed and legend, uh, and is centered on on interests and passion. Uh, so, if you read. Uh, uh, again and again he comes 
back to Manzoor Qadir, uh, mentioning that, you know, he was his, how close of a friendship it was and how it was beyond any kinds of uh, limitations. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, uh, my relationship with Amit started with a passion and an interest and then grew into something that you know is 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 not really concerned with any and i think that uh, khushwan singh would really have approved of that uh, uh, and the other thing the way book connects with uh, khushwan singh is is this whole theme of crossing borders and the the uh, you know he felt about relations between increase were created and his, his his emphasis on being human with really the way to resolve differences is not through blows but through talking to each other engaging with each other conversing with each other uh, and I think that this book illustrates this, this, the crossing of borders, the coming together, the talking. And I think Khushwan Singh would also have approved of that. And that makes me very, very happy and uh, 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 really honored to connect Khushwan Singh in the, to, to India uh, a number of times, but and and Khushwan Singh was, was very important. Uh, uh, you know, he was bigger than life. He was very important in our house. I inherited train to learn from my father's library. Uh, it when it told, and then it went all over. My wife read it. Two sons read it. Still have that that from you know like maybe this list somewhere in the 1950s. It's an old thing still in my, my library and when I was looking for it I found five other books by Hoy, all of them you know like here so um, uh, it's uh, when I went to India I tried to meet Khushwan Singh because of a cool relationship but uh, my wife when she was, was there she in 1991 she didn't have the same, same compunction so she had an invitation and, and did uh, meet uh, Khushwan Singh and for uh, that was enough of an association and being on the Khushwan Singh Literary Festival is really a way of coming together uh, which gives a lot of uh, pleasure. Thank you. That is really, really wonderful. In fact, uh, if we may uh, connect him uh, to Ghalib in this way, ke because uh, his was also a very different and better way to write Khushwan Sahib that there are more good in the world in the world that say that it is a good way to write Khushwan Sahib. There is no doubt that these people were very, uh, should I say, important uh, markers of their time. And yeah, the, hmm. the history of, I mean, because reading the, about the life of Ghalib or the life of Ishwan Singh uh, really puts us in touch with that time and that is really wonderful. So uh, by way of uh, closing then, Amit, I would like you to, uh, you know, give us your final reflections about what your hopes are for this book and uh, what you plan to do going forward. So, uh, I just want to go back to what Anjum was saying, you know, hum, about borders and so forth. We are going through the same way in India, mein, Pakistan mein, aur jagah par bhi. I think we are going to need uh, all the cultural resources at our disposal to see us through these times and emerge, uh, you know, uh, emerge as what we think our cultures are capable of emerging as. Uh, and and uh, we see this very much as part of that. You know, Halib is one person, but really, what what the experiment, you know, the the sort of South Asian cultural experiment has been over these past hundreds of years, it transcends not only religion but class and many boundaries. So we've got these dialogues going on at every level of society. Right? Uh, so somebody like Kabir is talking at a 
very different level from where Ghalib is talking, but they are deeply engaging with difference and trying to find that human uh, connection which will build a strong society. Uh, so, you know, without being too grand about this book, obviously I have no illusions that this book is going to do it. But, uh, you know, for me it is about that. It's a long fight, I think. We are, we are in for a very, very long fight. Um, and we need all the love, uh, you know, that has been produced by people like this. I mean, that's what you see, right? When you when you read somebody like Alev, you just, what Anjum was saying, you, it's what uh, you which connects people that, you know, you and I seem to resonate with this one thing. We are going to need a lot of that. Uh, and, and I hope that this book is, you know, one step in that, uh, in that direction. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, uh, you know, both of you have, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, first of all, Anjum, would you like to make concluding uh, st uh, remarks? Because uh, then I'll just uh, say a little about your book and close the session. Raza, just that uh, I hope there's other people to form links and collaborate. You know, we have shown, Amit and I, uh, this has not been been mentioned but we still have not met face to face you know we have done, done all this on, online through zoom etc and it's possible uh, if, if people uh, you know shared concerns shared aspirations uh, we should connect at the level of individuals and that is how i think we can overcome uh, you know the barriers that are placed in our way uh, I think that's my point. So this is a very unique collaboration, therefore. It is a collaboration uh do hastiya jo hai Amit or Al Anjum unke darmiyan ek bahut hi gair zaruri sarhad hai. There is a boundary that is beyond uh, which is uh, unnecessary at least for uh, the connections that they can uh, develop for themselves. And so uh, I want to conclude by uh, by quoting two Ashaq. Both of them find a place in uh, Anjum and Amit's book. Ke pehla to ye hai ke hai pare sarhade idraak se apna masjood. That my my worship, my place of worship is beyond the boundary of understanding even. So it goes into some spiritual realm. But I want to focus on the fact that it's boundary spanning. Hai pare sarhade idraak se apna masjood qibla ko ahle nazar qibla numa kehte hain. What you think of as the place you want to bow your head is nothing but a compass. It's just showing you the way. Uh, and therefore, different groups can uh, find, find ways in which to cross that boundary. And finally, in closing, I would like to say that uh, uh, what is going on, like uh, Amit said, uh, it's going to require a certain amount of, uh, you know, active uh, pushing back against all the forces that divide us. But it also helps to have an ironic attitude. And Ghalib says, Banakar fakiron ka hum bhes Ghalib. Banakar fakiron ka hum bhes Ghalib. Tamashai ahle karam dekhte. That we pretend to be, you know, gestures almost. Fakir here, of course, is uh, somebody who is uh, not really concerned. Uh, we pretend to be that, and we just watch the procession of the world as it goes by. Uh, I thank uh, Amit and Anjum uh, profusely for the wonderful work they have done in putting out this book, Thinking with Ghalib. And uh, I hope that our listeners uh, enjoyed the session and look forward to having more such sessions in the future. Thank you very much. And an especial thanks to the organizers of the Kushwan Singh Literary Festival and uh, more power to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that was really wonderful. And I was privileged to have a look at the book today. And one of the things I really appreciated about it was the fact that you had used different scripts so that the book would be accessible to people from different um, different parts of South Asia and indeed from London. You know, I mean, I, I'm from the department that 
um, had Ralph Russell in it. So Carlib has been very much around me for a long time in my life. But um, one thing I would like to say after this wonderful talk is that something about relating it to the Kushwant Singh uh, borders theme, but also to his ecology theme. Because one thing the festival does is together with Grow Trees, they plant a tree for every speaker at the, at the Kushwant Singh Literary Festival since it began 10 years ago. And this year they, they are trees for tigers, which are going to be planted in the Sundarbans National Park in West Bengal. And for the younger viewers, it might surprise them perhaps that Anjumal Taf was born in Narayan Gunj, which is now in Bangladesh, I believe. Um, and those of us who have read Nirad Chaudhary, whose son also taught at my college, um, are very familiar with Narayan Gunj. And so this connection, again, we're always seeing these loops and circles and we go round and we move forwards, but always keeping these connections open. And I think Ghalib, Kushwant Singh and people like you are great ways of connecting us across borders. Many thanks to all of you for such a wonderful and stimulating session today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Hi, everyone. I'm Rahul Singh, the son of Kushwan Singh. We began a literary festival 11 years ago in his name in Kasoli, uh, at the Kasoli Club. Uh, Kasoli is where he did much of his writing and where there is a family home. Uh, then uh, it went off very successfully. And then uh, a few years ago, we decided that we would move it to London uh, because that is where he studied uh, and where he served as a diplomat and where he imbibed a lot of the values and passions that he held subsequently. Uh, we had it uh, physically in London for two years and then sadly the pandemic set in. So we've only been able to have it uh, online. And this year too, uh, it's online. Uh, but we've had a marvelous lot of speakers and the theme is one that I think resonates widely. And the, the theme is crossing borders. Uh, you know, while I was listening to all the speakers, uh, something came to my mind. And that is the iconic song by John Lennon. Because in many ways, uh, it contains many of the elements that we have talked about and the speakers have talked about. So I'll just quote a little bit of that song. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion too. I hope someday you will join us and the world will be one. No need for greed or hunger, the brotherhood of man. Now, that is something which I find was in almost every session. Uh, John Lennon talks about uh, there being no countries, meaning no borders. And that's what we've been talking about. Borders can be terribly cruel as the session on Ukraine showed us, uh, but borders have to be crossed. Um, uh, there was a session on Galen, and there again, uh, I think he would have loved those words of John Lennon because they have the same sentiment, the same feelings as Galib had. Uh, and Galib and my father had many traits in common. One was irreverence, uh, one was humor, but then also there was friendship. And I think friendship is the theme that covers 
all our session friendships between countries, friendship, contacts with everybody. Uh, and uh, it's what I think John Lennon also talked about. Uh, and here I'd like to sort of also quote another great writer, E.M. Foster, uh, who wrote Passage to India. And in one of his books, he wrote, um, if a day comes when I have to choose between my friends and my country, I hope I have the courage to choose my friends. Now, that again is something which it was a very bold thing to say, very, very courageous thing to say. And if I said it now, I would be probably accused of sedition. But that's what John Lennon also said. The value of friendship, the value of friendships between all countries, erasing borders, uh, having no countries at all. Um, and this has resonated all throughout our, you know, the, the Kushwan Singh Lit Fest is really about connecting people, as are all the literary fests. There are so many literary festivals that have come up and they all connect people all over the world. Uh, so on that note, may I now go and thank all the people who made this uh, Lit Fest such a successful one. We have so many partners, speakers and friends to thank for London today. And our speakers, as I've just mentioned, have connected across continents and brought you a range of sessions. Uh, you will, the speakers, you can see them all on the screen at the moment there. They've given us marvelous sessions. I mentioned Ghalib. I mentioned uh, the some of the others. Uh, now, let's just go to the ones who have really helmed, have hosted our, uh, our all our sessions, which is uh, Rachel Dwyer and Fakir Ejazuddin. Know them as Rachel and Fakir Ejazuddin is popularly or, or by, call, all, by all of us called Ejaz. So they are the two people who've been with us Ajaz has been with us right from the beginning, a very close friend of my dad's. And Rachel connects with India for a long, long time. Then we come to uh, Zareen Kama, Z as he's known as, Indra Neel and Mayfair Hotels have been with us since the day we landed in London. Mayfair Hotels hosted our first London physical festival, Z Kama. And then there is Navtej Sarna, the High Commissioner in London, the Indian High Commissioner in London, who is the one who uh, encouraged us to come to London and have the Lit Fest in London. And he's been our supporter ever since. And then we have the partners. Uh, who have supported us in many, many ways. This Lit Fest would not have been possible without them. And of course, the most important of all in many ways is public funding by the National Lottery through Arts Council England. We are deeply grateful for their support. And two people who gave us the confidence to go for London. Chan and Pushpinder Chaudhary and their tongues on fire, which is the theme of their, uh, their, uh, their what they do in London. The Cambridge Society Bombay, uh, Grays in London, where dad was the barrister. Special thanks to Professor Satvinder Just of King's College London. Uh, then our other supporters and friends, 1469, which is the name of the brand that Harinder and Kiran bring out. And 1469 happens to be the birth date of Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism. And they have been with us since inception. Uh, and they're wonderful stores in North India and online. Then there's Vita Botics, Holiday Inn, Wed Lake Bell, Mahi Mera, Omiyar Mehta, Barry and Lily Sani, Harki Singh, all these 
have helped us enormously uh, all throughout. Uh, then grow trees, uh, which is uh, thanks to Pradeep Shah. Uh, he's they planted trees for each speaker at the KSLF. We now have thousands of trees. Uh, I, I recall that when uh, we had Jane Goodall coming here, uh, instead of uh, uh, saying that, you know, this is her fee, we said, can we plant some trees for you? So 100 trees were planted in the Sundarbans in her name, in Jane Goodall's name. So that was the beautiful, wonderful gesture. And she was very, very pleased with that. And this has been a tradition since the inception of the Lit Fest 100 years ago, in, uh, 10 years ago in Kasoli. And to date, we have done about 1,000 trees. Thank you, Pradeep Shah. Thank you very much. Um, and this is the national park in Sundarbans, uh, so that the tigers do not cross their borders. Uh, because and, and hopefully, they get more and more numerous, the tigers in the Sundarbans, with more and more trees there. Then our, our patrons who have been so supportive all through, besides Zed, Navtej, Vikram Jeet Sani, there's also Baroness Tessa Blackstone and Camellia Punjabi, who have both been very old friends of mine. Camellia goes back, friendship goes back to our Cambridge days. And Tessa, when she was um, a very, uh, you know, uh, junior uh, lecturer, I think at the London School of Economics, uh, and then we became friends. Now, of course, she's a member of the House of Lords, Baroness uh, Blackstone. Our advisory board to as many old friends, Imtiaz Dharkar, Samak Tali, Prashotam Dheer, Zareer Masani, TCA Raghavan, who was our former High Commissioner in, in Pakistan, then our media partners, Eastern Eye, uh, and then we come, of course, to our wonderful audience. Uh, we do all this for you, and you have been our biggest supporters. Uh, in Kasoli, we began initially with just about 100 to 200, audience of 100 to 200. Last time, we had a physical audience of about a thousand, over a thousand people in Kasoli. So we're hoping to go back to Kasoli again this year, this coming October. Uh, then I would like to thank our amazing team, all volunteers from all over the world, across countries, across borders, as the theme goes, uh, from the UK, Malaysia, Pakistan, and India. It's a totally volunteer-led festival since its inception. And each one brings passion and drive and commit commitment that I find very heartwarming and quite un unprecedented. Uh, Nilufar and I get all the credit, but Team KSLF deserves it all because they slog away behind the scenes. A big hand from our audience for Team KSLF. Bharat Avlani, who's been keeping our spirits alive, he's there all the time, every uh, practice session we have telling us where we can improve. Um, Ashwini, our technical whiz kid, uh, who based in Chandigarh, uh, people say Chandigarh is not known for uh, high high end technology, but you have to see Ashwini to know that Chandigarh is producing some of our best uh, technical people. Our social media team, that's again something new. Social media has become very big. So we have our social media team led by Kiran and Harinder, who I mentioned earlier. They also have the brand of 1469. Pooja, Parneet, Ritika, and Parvinder, Gurvinder, Rishma, Disha. Then Ashima, Bath who's been our brainwave right from the beginning. She was a great favorite of my father's. Uh, and uh, whenever he came, uh, she came over to Raj Villa, he would show her a pile of books that he had received. Take any of them, he would say. So I think uh, Ashima has got quite a lot of books from my father, and she's a voracious reader. 
uh, and she's been an English teacher and who's been with us from the start 10 years, 11 years ago. There are media people who have been propagating KSLF all over India and the world. Kishi Singh and Ajay Bhardwaj, Madhur Singh. And then our photographer who's been taking, clicking away pictures. He, I think, must have got thousands of pictures of all the lit fest that we've had in Pasoli. Uh, they're all available if you want them. Ajay Bhatia. And then there are creatives by Team Paparazzi, Ritika, Gayatri, Shalani, Imani. And Rahul Goba, who's again been with us for a long time, is always willing to support. Thanks to all of you uh, for the Lit Fest. Well, I've come to the end of, of this. Uh, crossing Borders, as I said, has been a marvelous theme. And uh, we have crossed borders with this Lit Fest. And I hope that more borders are crossed. In fact, I hope that borders are eliminated one day. As just, just as John Lennon said, as I mentioned right in the start, there should be no countries at all. We don't want any countries. We want one, one world. And we want the brotherhood of man. He mentioned that also, the brotherhood of man. Thank you very much, everybody. And I look forward to you coming to our next Lit Fest as well. Thank you.